Good morning. Would members of the Planning and Housing Committee please report to Committee Room 1 for quorum? Okay, good morning everybody. Welcome to meeting 10 of the Planning and Housing Committee. For those uh, in the room with us, the screen at the back of the room provides real-time updates concerning where we are in the agenda and what's coming up next. You can follow the agenda and the bait on your computer, tablet or smartphone at www.toronto.ca slash council. And we acknowledge the land we are meeting on. It's the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Haudenosaunee, the Chippewa, Odoshani, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Are there any declarations of interest under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act? Seeing none, can I have a motion to confirm the minutes of the October 15th, 2019 uh, meeting? Councillor Perks, Perks, all those in favour? That carries. Okay, let's now go through the agenda. Item uh, 1, City Initiated Priority Retail Streets Zoning Bylaw Amendments. Final, final report. Uh, it's time for 9.45. Item 2, Housing Now, 777 Victoria Park Avenue, Zoning Amendment, Final Report, timed for 10 o'clock, and we do have deputants on this item. Item 10.3, Inclusionary Zoning, Public Consultation, Comments and Updates. We have speakers. 
10.4, amendments to Chapter 354, Apartment Buildings and Progress Update on Rent Safe to Yo. We also have speakers and a presentation. And that is it. That is it. Okay. So, given the time, uh, we have a few minutes. So, why don't we start with item three, inclusionary zoning. Uh, and the first speaker on that is Alejandra Ruiz Vargas. Alejandra? You're up. Good morning, Alejandra. And we are at item 10.3, Inclusionary Zoning, Public Consultation, Comments and Update. Inclusionary Zoning now? Yeah. Oh, shoot. I'm not ready for that yet. Okay. Well, so I'll try another speaker and I'll call you. Please, thank you. 10, thank 15 you, minutes. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Marcia Stone. Is Marcia? Hi, Marcia. Hi, how are you? Good. I sit here. Thanks for joining us. You have five minutes. Okay, my name is Marcy Stone, and I'm a Toronto ACORN member in our Western chapter. I moved to Toronto three years ago and live in a one-bedroom apartment with my daughter and my grandson. I'm a retired senior living on a fixed income every month who applied to a seniors building in my area as well as Toronto Community Housing Corporation for the Western Road area, and both say I'm on a waiting list. As far as I understand it, the uh, Toronto Community Housing wait list is at least 14 years or more. I'm not sure how often that's updated. Um, one of the first things I noticed after moving here was how unaffordable um, Toronto is to live. I know people that have moved here and ended up, ended up moving back home because they could not afford to live in Toronto. When I see a new development being advertised as affordable housing, I know that it doesn't really mean it's affordable. That's what I've grown used to. Affordable to the city means one thing, and to low and moderate income families, it means something else. To me, affordability is rent geared to income or subsidized housing, not average market rent. The definition of affordable needs to be changed by policy at all levels of government, as this is not just a crisis in Toronto, but across Canada. The city is quick to build new condos on public lands, but fail to listen to working people who can't afford to live in them. Therefore, you see a lot of condos sitting around empty. Uh, is there public lands in District 5 that can be turned into rent gear to income or subsidized housing? It seems that improvements or some of the plans are in the downtown areas, not the areas that it's needed the most. I would never be able to afford to live in an apartment building and pay market rent by myself, even though I'm a retired federal government employee. Even new senior housing developments that are being built in my own neighborhood are not affordable. Uh, they're talking about building a senior's building right up the street from me. Um, the rent alone for one bedroom or a studio is $1,100 plus utilities and water and whatever else. That's ridiculous. That is not a senior's affordable building and all the bells and whistles that they put in there. Um, the city needs to move forward with inclusionary zoning and to do everything that they can to ensure everyone has affordable housing. At our monthly ACORN meeting in Weston, many people share how 50 to 80% of their income goes just to paying the rent. So where do you pay, how do you pay for food? How do you pay for other things? Um, in every new development, 
There needs to be 20 to 30 percent set aside of affordable units and affordability needs to be based on your income. These units should also be affordable forever, not just for 25 years. All these new condo developers and that coming into the city, they're getting wonderful incentives, 25 years or more, that they don't have to pay tax. But we have to pay rent, we have to pay our taxes, and we're not getting the services that we require. The city needs to act now and move forward with inclusionary zoning. Please consider the seriousness of the concerns and issues of low and moderate Tor Torontonians whom you all represent regarding affordable housing while you return to your homes and families this evening. I thank you. Thank you. Any questions of the deputant? Seeing none, thank you so much, Marcia. Josie Weir. I have a question. I have a question first. Am I doing both deputations? No, you're just uh, making your deputation on inclusionary zoning public consultation. Okay, thanks. Thank you. And you have five minutes to do so. Okay, thanks. Great. Thank you. My name is Josie Weir. I'm an EGCOR member uh, from East York. I was born in Toronto, and I'm a student in my second year of college. I can't afford to pay for market value rent. I live with a friend who is willing to charge me uh, $7,200 for rent per year for a small room in her house. I get only $9,800 a year from OSAP. One third of this is a student loan. How is it possible to live? I hear all the time from other ACORN members at our meetings about the rent being a major issue. People getting above guideline rent increases of 3%, 5%, 8%. The average cost of a one-bedroom apartment in Toronto is $1,270 a month. That's $15,000 a year. But in my neighborhood, the beaches area, I looked online, a one-bedrooms are $1,800 a month plus hydro. That's over. 21,000 a year and the, hydro, and the hydro just went up. Before 1980, I had never seen any homeless people on the street. Now they're everywhere. Shelters are over full. I hear about tenants getting renovicted from their homes when the greedy developers buy their buildings and then try to buy them out for a few thousand dollars or try to harass them and give them fake eviction papers until they get so scared they leave. There are so many condos being built all over Toronto and we need inclusionary zoning to make sure that there's affordable units being built in those condos. This is our city and we shouldn't be allowing developers to take it over. Low and moderate income people need to benefit from development too, not just the rich and powerful. So it seems like everyone in Toronto is in agreement with Eckhorn's demands. Based on this report, 20 to 30 percent of developments should be set aside as affordable housing. The units should be affordable forever. There should be deep affordability and this should happen all over the city. Doug Ford is trying to mess up inclusionary zoning because he doesn't care about the people, just his wealthy developer friends. We need our city councils to stand up to Doug Ford and his croonies and keep moving forward. Every day that inclusionary zoning is delayed, another missed chance for affordable units to be built. Eggcorn members are urging you to move ahead on inclusionary zoning and be a champion for the city and a champion for low and moderate income communities. Thank you. Thank you so much. Any questions? Seeing none, thanks for joining us today. And uh, Christina Abbott. 
Christina? Whoa. This is the chair. Uh, my name is Christina Abbott. I'm a Toronto ACORN member in the East York chapter. I thank you for allowing me to speak today. I, I've lived in Toronto for over 50 years, and in this building, nine. And I love my neighbourhood. I'm a tenant at 110 Unity Road, which is a non-profit, independent living seniors building in East York. My church is here, my community is here, my life is here. In the years I've lived here, I've seen such, such unaffordability in Toronto. I pay 1069 for rent in a one-bedroom unit, and I have a monthly income of $2,900. That's with three pensions. I have a number of health issues that require frequent doctor's visits and a high cost of medication. There's, there is also living and traveling expenses that I have to cover as well. My building has issues with mold and bed bugs, cockroaches, and repairs not being done. Well, and it costs me to have people come in and prep my apartment. I'm unable to do so. Um, there's damage to furniture and clothing. If I move out of my building, I wouldn't be able to afford housing anywhere near my community. It would also mean that I have to choose between paying rent and not eating or paying for medication. We need the city to move forward in inclusionary zoning because we are currently living in a housing crisis. Some of my neighbors have opted out of taking medication every day because they can't afford it if they pay rent. That's unacceptable. This is why we need deep affordability, so nobody has to choose between being able to feed themselves and their family, buying essential medication, or being able to pay rent. In every new development, there needs to be at least 20 to 30 percent of affordable units, and that needs to be affordable forever, not 25 years. Market rent is not affordable for myself and thousands of other low to moderate income people in the city. This is why rent needs to be geared to income, not average market rent. The city needs to act now and to step up to protect tenants like myself who are being priced out of their own community. We can't wait for the province because they're too busy being in the pocket of developers. We need affordability housing now. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Any questions? Seeing none, thanks for joining us today. Uh, Robert Field. Sorry, sir, it doesn't work like that. Uh, Robert Field. Thank you. Uh, my thanks to the chair and to the councillors for this opportunity to speak uh, on the matter of inclusionary zoning. My name is Robert Field. I'm the uh, current chair of the Federation of Metro Tenants Association, and I'm also uh, a, a a tenant association president up in uh, Don Mills. With me is uh, Jordy Dent, the executive director of our federation. Uh, so I just had some opening commentaries to make. You know, there's been a full participation uh, in in consultations, etc., on this issue. Uh, one of the observation is that in, in preparing for this, I, I looked at some of the uh, materials with uh, various. Uh, reports that have been done in the city of Boston and in the city of New York, uh, New York City. Um, the current provincial government changed some of the provisions uh, for an inclusionary zoning, uh, and now it's only available in certain areas. And my thoughts would be that that should be Toronto-wide because uh, everybody's affected by this. Affordable housing is an emerging, not just emerging, it's been around for a long time as an issue, and we need to address it. So I'm asking, of course, Council uh, to take next more steps on this matter. Uh, we were per participants in the uh, consultation process, and that is always an interesting uh, scenario when you've got different stakeholders with different views on the matter. Um, we believe that we should, we should build as many affordable units as are required, not as other stakeholders may try to uh, minimize, etc. There's a lot of uh, units on the market that need to be uh, built. The city report says that only 2% two, two of to the 230,000 new units were designated as affordable. Uh, perhaps that should be somewhere in the nature of 30 to 35% or more. So I would ask you to be looking at that. 
Another issue is the length of the period that, this, that, that covers this. Um, and we don't want that to be a short period because it won't meet the needs. And I looked also at the Boston report where they were looking at something like 50 years. That may be a good start, but I'll uh, leave that all up to you. Uh, Jordy? Nope. No other comments, so all of which is respectfully submitted. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions for the deputant? Yep. Sorry. Could you sit back down? Uh, Councillor Layton has a question. Yes. Thank you very much. So the proposal in front of us is essentially for us to wait to hear back from the province about what they're going to allow us to include. Do you have any faith that the province is really going to allow us to do very much? Well, we're supposed to be non-political, but as a, as a, as a uh, citizen, I would have to submit that it's, when I'm not overly optimistic. It's not partisan. Yes, we're non-partisan. Now, if, if this province comes back and says, here's the maximum you're allowed to do, and it's not something that city council or the members of ACORN or the city at large thinks is enough to address the affordability crisis that we have in housing in our city. Do you think we have much recourse given the province would have just passed regulations telling us what we could do? Well, uh, the provincial government does pass a lot of laws that bind us in regardless of what we would prefer to happen. Do you have any comment on um, I, I can tell you that I, you know, I hear a lot of times um, from various councillors uh, in Toronto City Council um, that there are things you can try. And I only mention that because it's a crisis. Um, there are maybe extreme measures or difficult measures or measures that put, might put you into conflict with the province. But it, I think in our opinion, that's what you do during a crisis because people dying on the streets, it, it's not a status quo you can accept. So. Thank you. I just have one question. Have you ever had the chance to meet with your city councillor and the MPP together or requested those types of meetings from FMTA about this particular issue? Um, uh, sorry, as the ED, uh, we generally have, we've met with a lot of city councillors and we uh, met with almost every MPP in Toronto or we're in the process of doing that. But I don't think we've ever been in a scenario where we meet with them together. Is there um, a reason why not? Like why we wouldn't have a MPP and a councillor meeting like at the same time? Yes, about an issue that's in front of both governments. Um, uh, generally, it's just a scheduling problem for us. You know, we, me? It's often a scheduling problem for us, so for we'll you ask. you or for them or for who? Well, we've, we've, asked to, we've asked to meet with people at the start of every term. Uh, and we've asked to meet with MPPs and councillors. Um, but it's uh, added a level of difficulty for us when we're trying to schedule two people at the same time. So that's all. Do you not think that would be a wise thing to do? We would love if folks were able to meet with us um, both at the same time. It would be a lot easier for us. It's just, uh, it's not again... top priority for you. Pardon? It's not a top priority for you. Oh, it, meeting with people is definitely a top priority together. for us. I'm talking about meeting together. Uh, again, um, if, if folks are able to make that happen in terms of schedule, we are more than happy to do so, and we'd love to. Sounds like the onus is on them. I, I, we, again, we've, we've asked to meet with councillors and MPPs for the last year, um, so uh, that's been our onus and we've been pushing that uh, as best as we can. In terms of meeting together, it's, uh, it's again, it's not something that anyone's ever really suggested to us. And so I'm get suggesting that to you. Happy to do so. Thank you, councillor. So noted. Um, there may be other people here that want to get on the speakers list that came this morning that aren't, and if you would speak to somebody. Over here, if you came today and want to be on. And I'll turn it back over to the chair. Thank you. Uh, Carl Kujawa. Carl? It, it's five minutes. If other people want to speak, you can ask for your name in here. You add your name. Just. Okay, so you ha I have other people that have already signed up. So one person or you, all of you can speak for five minutes. You can add other five minutes later on. Can I have Carl or the group? You have five minutes right now. Okay. Okay. 
Is Anna Teresa? Is okay. So you're next. So come on, Carl, Anna, Sean Mahar. Sorry. Five, okay. There's five of us, and we'd like to merge all of our five deputations, yeah. if that's possible. They, two of them have just been added, so you might not see them on your list. Um, and we wanted to plug in a, uh, a video clip, which is from our community deputations. Okay. How long is the, the deputation? So we each have five minutes, and there's five of us, so we may take up to 25 minutes. Okay, but I have other people that have signed up that are in between. Because we're happy to let so, them go yeah. first. Okay, so say. let's let's do that. Sean, you're up next. Yeah, that's what I was. Is everybody signed up? Get to. It says show now. Thank you. My name is Sean Maher, and I'm here on behalf of Convene Toronto. Um, as I think everybody in the room knows, the City of Toronto has been asking for inclusionary zoning powers for many, many years. As Councillor Balalao likes to say, we've asked over 17 times in the past 10 years to be able to get inclusionary zoning. And as our planning department noted in 2016, um, we are missing out on about 2,400 units of affordable housing every year that we wait. And the pace of development in Toronto has gone up, not down, since 2016. So the pace of missed opportunity is also rising. Given that, I think there's a strong feeling in the community and hopefully around the council table um, that we need to be moving as swiftly as humanly possible to be implementing inclusionary zoning. And as um, Bill 108 unfortunately imposed, um, there are several legs to that process now, all of which require us to be moving um, quickly and bringing pieces of the puzzle in place. We need to be identifying protected major transit areas um, uh, where we can do inclusionary zoning under Bill 108. Um, there is policy direction that needs to go to staff um, to begin to draft the bylaws. There are draft bylaws that need to be developed um, that need to reflect content that uh, shows what it is that the community really wants from this. All of this requires several steps in the process, and delaying the beginning of that process means missing out on 2,400 units a year, every year, as that process moves forward. Waiting for Bill 108 regulations is, in that context, not a great idea. Um, there is as far as we can see, no deep compulsion on the part of the province to move forward with those regulations swiftly and give the City of Toronto um, clear guidance around inclusionary zoning. Um, they have gone a considerable period of time already without issuing, issuing those regulations. And though those regulations will be a useful part of doing that work, um, there is a lot of work we can do before that. And there are currently regulations in place um, under which the City of Toronto can proceed and can proceed with um, a good bylaw. Um, part of that work, as I mentioned before, is picking out those um, protected major transit stations um, and beginning to pass the bylaws that, that make those eligible for inclusionary zoning. And part of it is taking a good, hard look at the existing policy direction um, that we've had a conversation about. The report in front of you lays out in um, uh, fairly uh, compelling detail uh, what the community said about the existing policy direction. And it said very, very clearly um, that temporary affordability, the 25-year affordability that's been proposed, is not a great idea. Um, the community was not alone in that. Uh, the City of Toronto invited to um, uh, the YWCA last week the Commissioner of Housing for New York City, who said um, almost word for word, do not pursue temporary affordability periods. You should never have to recommission um, the same affordable units over and over and over again. She was a great speaker and a wonderful guest and deeply insightful, and I encourage you to take her advice. Um, uh, the community encourages the same. Uh, deeper affordability was another thing that both the Commissioner of Housing from New York City and the community talked about very, very clearly. Inclusionary zoning um, can work in a lot of different ways. The way it works in New York um, and Vancouver and many major urban centers is that we vary the number of units that are set aside so we can deepen the affordability. Um, there is a housing crisis. It touches everyone. 
The people it touches most profoundly are people living on lower incomes who cannot afford um, apartments at 100% of AMR or 80% of AMR. And in New York City, they're able to get that down to 40 and 30% of the, average, the area median income um, using that variation, using inclusionary zoning. That's a goal that we should be building into our bylaw. Um, and uh, last but not least, um, there is a, a, a deep feeling that we should be moving, as New York City does, um, as most U.S. jurisdictions that use inclusionary zoning do, to thinking about affordability in terms of what people can actually afford, not what landlords rent for. Um, and so an income-based affordability measure would be a huge help. Um, we do know that inclusionary zoning doesn't work if the um, development industry comes to a screeching halt. We do need a system that reflects um, the markets so that we are um, asking of developers something that, that um, doesn't prevent them from moving forward with developments. And we know that that varies throughout the city. And it will vary by those protected major transit station areas that we select. Um, Bill 108 isn't going to change that, um, even if it sets different levels of cost for other community contributions. We are going to continue to need to be sensitive to a changing environment of what developers can afford. Um, and so there really isn't an impediment to moving forward right now um, with inclusionary zoning strategies, um, even if the province of Ontario decides to drag its feet and not bring those regulations forward. Thank you. Just for you, Councillor Fletcher. Yeah, I just wanted to ask you about the RGIs. And we did get a report, you may have seen that from the Auditor General, who talked about how well RGIs are being managed. Mm -hmm. Understand there's some 60 odd thousand RGIs in the city. It, yeah, that's probably right, yeah. As my understanding is that the, uh, there's no new RGIs in the city. It's not something that we can conjure up, that we don't have the ability to simply create RGIs here at the city? We, we've not been creating a lot of RGI units. Um, there, there are tools that you can use to create um, units that um, are accessible to people at income levels that are typical of um, uh, people in RGI units, um, at least the higher end of that. Um, but you do have to get down to roughly 40% of AMR, um, which is, is a very, very uh, low cost. It's a cost that basically has to eliminate almost the entire cost of the original development. So it's, it's, it's tricky to do, but you and do have... Where, you're aware that when we've gone to 40% AMR, mm -hmm. that's at the expense of other 60 or 80% yes. of AMR. So yeah. to get so there's to a direct... what would technically be an RGI unit, mm -hmm. then we're eliminating other units. Would you agree with that? Uh, yeah, and that's exactly what the Commissioner of Housing from New York said. Right. It's what you need to do is vary the set aside um, to get more depth. Right. Um, if you want more Which depth, then you have to give up some volume. If you want more volume, you have to give up some depth. And all I'm mentioning done. is that, that right now in the City of Toronto, the people most profoundly affected by this are the people who need deeply affordable housing, and so we cannot ignore them in the inclusionary zoning bylaw. It would be a huge mistake. That has been done, I believe, in West Donlands, where we have wide range of affordability certain developments but can the province not introduce a number of new rgis anywhere throughout the throughout the province of ontario as I, long as I, we're subsidizing them I, I think that it would be an understatement to say that the province of ontario is utterly failing no um, i'm not the asking if they're failing i'm not asking if they're failing rgi as an rgi mm -hmm. is, is initiated at the provincial level and the city simply services that do you agree with me? I, I believe that's the case for most RGI units. Well, uh, I, I couldn't say for, I, it's not a piece of data I have in front of me. Okay, so I believe that's the case. Yeah. So anything that we do that is within the affordable units, now we're taking other ones out in order to get to a 40%, which technically isn't an RGI unit. It's not considered no. an RGI it unit. It would be a deeply affordable unit, not an RGI deeply unit. Deeply affordable unit, not an RGI. So if indeed the province does have that ability to create new RGIs, should that not also be a focus on the province to, I don't know, there's only 63,000. I don't think that's changed in years, and yet we have a much greater population and a much uh, greater need. Is there anybody you're aware of that is campaigning to increase RGIs? So um, the folks that have been working on inclusionary zoning, the housing issues group that meets in Toronto monthly, um, also uh, was intervening on the Bill 108 policy. 
and has been intervening with the Minister of Housing to try and press for a housing policy that actually reflects the real needs of um, uh, people who are struggling in the housing crisis. Bill 108 did not achieve that. Um, the response from Minister Clark was, frankly, inadequate to what the community was asking for. Um, it was helpful in a couple of areas, um, uh, mostly technical areas around how uh, affordable housing is managed, but did not make what is the fundamentally most important thing about addressing the housing crisis, which is meaningful public public investments in the construction of units that are purpose-built rental affordable units. However, there could be an introduction of RGIs for existing units. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be new. They could introduce an increase in RGI yeah. to be used and applied in the City of Toronto or other cities at a provincial level. Yes, they could. It does not mean you have to build something to do that. They um, have that ability. It, it in fact, uh, to a large extent, does. What we're finding, um, and if you talk to most um, managers of rent ups and most affordable housing managers who don't have the bricks and mortar, um, is, is that the availability of units that you can apply a rent up to an RGI, um, RGI funding to is pretty limited, um, and if we don't actually increase affordable supply, an increase in rent stops or ID, RGI funding um, is going to be very challenging to apply. We ag absolutely need to do both. If we just do one and don't increase the actual bricks and mortar supply of affordable units that are purpose-built rental, we will not achieve that goal. Um, However, it's not, it's not a we had pick and choose. R you got to do both. Should we have extra RGIs? They could be applied anywhere, like along Eglinton. Yeah. And have you and your group somebody, worked, somebody have you and your group buildings. worked on all the planning applications? There's 22,000 new uh, homes to be built on the Eglinton LRT. Have you been watching that, going to the meetings, talking about increasing the affordability or any? any moves that would add affordable units along Eglinton East? It, it was our hope that, that a inclusionary zoning, so that inclusionary zoning would be helpful in that work. Are you talking about the Golden Mile? I'm talking about the Golden yes. Mile. How have you been involved in that? Um, I've been working with a residence group that has been um, creating uh, a, a, uh, a community-based strategy for the Golden Mile. Um, to, uh, to uh, articulate the, the needs for and the goals for affordable housing, but also other kinds of community benefits. Um, they meet at the uh, Working Women's Hub uh, in Victoria Village, a fantastic group of very mobilized residents who are, uh, are raising exactly the issues you're describing, because uh, as you say, yes. we critically need those affordable units in all of the places where we're densifying the how city, often, and the Golden Mile is certainly one of them. How often have you been to Scarborough Community Council with that group? Uh, I don't think that group's been to Scarborough Community oh, we Council haven't yet. Been there. It's a fairly new okay. group. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, so staff are proposing that we wait until the province comes out with their regulations and then sort of reconvene our work as uh, on, on, the, on, on an inclusionary zoning policy. What faith do you have that the province will set a rate or, or allow the municipality to actually achieve anything through its in inclusionary zoning uh, uh, policy uh, to, towards some of the goals that the housing organizations of Toronto are trying to achieve? I haven't seen a lot of indications from the province of Ontario that suggest that they are um, uh, eager or in any kind of a hurry to give the City of Toronto the tools it needs um, to be able to implement inclusionary zoning. Um, and I do think that there is room, um, even under the current regs and under the current legislation, for us to get a lot of the homework done. Um, and, and in fairness to the planning staff, they may be doing a whole bunch of that already, um, but I think the community would take a lot of comfort from seeing a schedule of how we're going to get there as fast as humanly possible and how we're going to use the regs we've got uh, until and unless the province gets around to uh, rolling out some regulations that, that uh, shape the future. More affordability, deeper affordability, longer affordability. Is that essentially what you'd like to hear from the city? Uh, yeah, and, and, uh, and on an affordability measure that actually reflects what people can afford. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Councillor Perks. Thank you, and thank you, Sean. I, I think uh, everyone in the room is in agreement that the, the goal is to get to long, permanent affordability and, and deep affordability. 
I, I think maybe we're arguing about tactics here. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to ask you, so you're aware that when the City of Toronto does approve uh, an inclusionary zoning bylaw, it's appealable to the new OMB? Yep. Okay. If we draft something ahead of the policy context that the province provides us, mm -hmm. without reference to it, mm -hmm. and then impose it the minute that they pass something, does that put us on a better footing? Um, I think that if, as long as it's compliant um, with what the regulations are when they come, or um, designed in a way to be, to be able to be rendered compliant, mm -hmm. um, I would expect that that should be um, a successfully defended bylaw. Okay. And if it's, but if it's not compliant, if we just do something, then we lose time at the back end because we're into a lengthy appeal and then maybe having to amend it and so on. Um, I have a fairly hearty suspicion that you're going to be into a lengthy appeal no matter what bylaw you pass. I see. Um, so, I'm, so I'm not sure the development industry is going to say, regardless of the bylaw, goodbye me, go right ahead. Right. So nobody should leave this room with the idea that if we just direct council, the staff to go draft an IZ bylaw, that it's being implemented in the next year. Nobody should leave with that impression. No, quite the, the inverse. Um, right now, and, and this is entirely on the province, the, the way they've structured things, there are a lot of legs to this process. Mm -hmm. um, um, the more legs there are, the better it is to get rolling early, um, to find those projected <clears throat> major transit stations that we want to start with, um, get them identified, um, decide right. what our overall policy direction is going to be, get that nailed down, begin to draft a bylaw. Um, uh, if we wait till 108 regs come out and then begin that work, um, that's going to be well, the I, I take your point. And then we're still going to get appealed and we're still going to be a, a, you know, a year and a half at the OMB. I take your point. I'm just trying to make sure that we understand each other. So. I think we agree we want permanent affordability, 99 years, that kind of thing. Yeah. I think we want to emphasize deep affordability. Mm -hmm. I think we want to make sure that whatever we draft, it's compliant mm -hmm. so we don't get thrown out right away and then have to go back to square one. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to all be mindful of the fact that uh, Premier Ford and his party have, have set things up so that in the best case, it's going to be well over a year before we're able to establish something. Um, I, think, I think there are long timelines that are confronting us, and at yeah. 2,400 units a year that we are missing I, out I, on. Sean, I'm just asking, yeah. those, those things that I just, are we in agreement on those points? I, I think we need to have all of those elements, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Thanks. Seeing none, thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, I have Darnell Harris. Oh, it's part of the group? Yeah. Okay, so let's start with Carl. So I need to plug this Mac into the projector. I think you, yeah. I have, I have a... Thunderbolt cord. Okay. That's what, you, that's what I was going to ask you. So can we have maybe somebody else that doesn't need the computer start? Is that good? So we're all going to have to spend use the time together. And I think so. we'll be under the amount of time overall. Okay, well, you bet you missed. So I'll just confirm that. Uh, right. Carl, Anna, Teresa, Darnell, Jeremy, and Kathy are all part of your group? Sure. Okay. Can, I pl can you confirm that? That's correct. This is all part of the group. And there's nobody else that would like to speak on this issue? Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we don't need to see this. Speak on what you want to plug it in a second. Okay. Good, mor uh, good morning, councillors. Um, I'm here today uh, with my fellow deputants to introduce to you the deputations of around 20 residents uh, who wanted to be here today, but as is so often the case during a working day, um, aren't able to. So we have uh, three people here who've been willing to cede their five minutes so that we can play three clips, which are a collage of some of the deputations from people who showed up to a workshop that uh, Teresa and I organized on behalf of the Parkdale People's Economy Affordable Housing Committee 
to discuss your progress in, uh, in implementing inclusionary zoning. Um, I'm glad to say we had uh, about 30 people brave the snow uh, to come to grips with this crucial moment in our city's history, and this was just this Monday, uh, and to put forward their concerns and their hopes for how you'll choose to proceed today and uh, over the next few months. And I know in neighborhoods all over the city there are going to be a lot more events like the ones we've organized. Community groups around the city are really excited that now our city is nearing the finish line and will be finally having a legal precedent to forcefully intervene into the affordability of this housing market, which has been so inhumanely unreceptive to the needs of lower income Torontonians. We all want to get this right. As the summary of the consultations released last week highlights, most of us who have been involved so far and many more will be getting involved in the coming months as we finally get to hone the official policy plan, uh, want to maximize the amount of affordable housing this city can require of future developments. I echo many of the recorded deputations to come when I say it's exciting to know this will mean a lot higher proportion of affordable housing and new developments than the old policy directions recommended. The feasibility assessments you commissioned along with Steve Pomeroy's excellent corroborating study make it clear that developers and landowners could still enjoy a decent profit if we required 20 and in some cases 30 percent affordable units in most condo developments all over the city. And we could even make some of those units affordable to those quite low income communities who need it most. So that's a whole lot of affordable housing we could be adding to our stock and relatively quickly if we're serious about making the most of inclusionary zoning. There are so, so many applications in the pipeline right now with so much opportunity for the next year or two alone. We really can't delay. It makes one realize how crucial a time this is for you all to stand up and loudly explain to Doug Ford and the whole province there is no way Toronto or any municipality should sit with their tails between their legs as he crushes our IZ to only apply to a tiny portion of our cities. I know that just as you and other councillors fought so inspiringly against Ford's retroactive cuts and won back funding for our city's public health, childcare, and other essential services, and just like you're going to fight for and win against his next round of cuts to those and other local initiatives, we all want to see you make Ford back down on his plan to crush IZ. I echo many advocates from around our city when I request that you keep moving forward with the Made in Toronto inclusionary zoning program. Don't ask planners to put this IZ process on hold, to wait for what could be many, many months before all the gags that Ford wants to bind our city with are spelled out in Bill 108. We want you to push Ford and call his bluff. I don't even think we'll see the details of the caps they're going to place on the so-called community benefits or the details on the diameters of the transit zones anytime soon. That's not in Ford's interests. He doesn't want to get into another fist fight with municipalities, especially not the 905 and outer reasons, which really care about these changes. And it's not like we're asking you to waste planners' time or city resources in moving ahead with drafting official plan policies. If they prepare the feasibility study and outline it for us, even if it gets batted down in half a year, we'll have at least forged ahead with much of the work that needs to be done to implement a Made in Toronto IZ policy. Let's keep moving forward and remind Ford and the rest of Toronto what's at stake. And we'll be damned if after decades of advocating for a tool we need more than ever, a tool which most of our peer cities have been using for decades is going to be ripped from our hands right at the finish line. Now, the first time I ever deputed here was a year and a half ago, um, when the Wynn administration had released its draft IZ policy regulations. They were terribly restrictive. And though I was nervous, I came out and cheered you on as the committee refused to be cowed into accepting a pathetic excuse for an IZ policy. You campaigned loudly and clearly with municipalities from across the province to be able to set our own course. And we won that fight because the province didn't want a black eye. This provincial government's starting to look like it wants one even less. So please seriously consider the deputations I have the pleasure of introducing you today and push forward the fight and continue a winning against this domineering province right now when hundreds of thousands of lower income Torontonians need you to implement these powers more than ever. Um, so I'm going to plug in some videos and um, if you can say like a, a moment, but they're five minutes each and there are three of them, so we don't want to waste that, uh, that time too much. Where, where is the sound in this mission? Uh, here, but I hope where? it won't come through. Oh, it won't. So, where? Where? So, I need you to tell me where it, exactly where this is. I'll tell you at. where it is once I just... Before you start. 
start playing it. You're going to find where it is. Toronto, I've moved seven times. Um, okay, so we're good to go. Um, my name is Sarah. I've lived in Toronto for um, 10 years, three of them in Parkdale, where I live right now. I, uh, in the 10 years I've lived in Toronto, I've moved seven times. Um, is it it's possible always been the difficult volume? to find an affordable place, but there's a heightened sense now that if I have to move, I won't be able to afford it. And um, not only am I worried about myself, Sorry. And in, in fact, the same sentence comes up over and over again, which is, if I have to move, I won't be able to afford to. Hi, everyone. My name is Beryl and Mark, and I live in the Parkdale community for the past 25 years. And one of the things I observe in my community that there are more than one family members living in a two and three bedroom apartment because they can't afford to live in a, their own individual apartment because they just can't afford to pay the rent. They're just not making enough money, uh, whether they're working for minimum wage, or they're making $18 an hour, or they're on ODSP, or Ontario Works. My name is Manza from Christopher House Community. And my name is Chris Bain. I'm Manza's classmate at West Neighborhood House. There are many people in this city need houses. Without houses, the number of homeless in the rent of the house increased to I'm sorry. to survive in the future. Hi, my name's uh, Carl. Uh, I'm a resident of uh, Parkdale and I'm obtaining my uh, Bachelor of Commerce degree at Ryerson University. Uh, I have a disability, so I'm on funding to um, uh, uh, Oh my god. Confusing that. Hi, my name. Um, I get ODSP, and that's not a lot of money to pay high rent. Hi, my name is Michael. Um, and the thing is for me is because. As my parents get older, Chinese uh, affordable housing as I don't know what the best way. We have a USB with these on. Would that be possible? I'm. I know everyone here doesn't want this to happen. This is frustrating. Um, It might be. I don't know when she's going to take care of me. We need affordable housing in the most area in the city. I think zoning. What? It across the entire city, not only in certain neighborhoods and certain areas. Affordable housing. That includes all levels of financial ability from um, an average income, low income, and for those who are at risk of homelessness. Um, and we need includes housing, um, a variety of housing size, one, two, three bedrooms, not only bachelor. We're going to try a different computer. If we have to cut short the videos, so be it. I know no one wants to see this. All the time. Uh, my recommendations for uh, inclusive zoning. We need government to sometimes uh, deal with uh, the market failures that uh, real estate, uh, that the real estate industry is creating uh, for those that are marginalized. Council has recently, we uh, recently affirmed that housing is a are one eviction away from being at risk. Yeah. 
seems like uh, we're going to have to cut it short. You, you know what I, I'm going to ask is that we actually just have the audio, and I can put this tiny little screen to okay. you. Okay, I think we get. I think we get the, the message. If you can just proceed, I think that we understand. And if you want to continue speaking, there's clearly some technical dif difficulties. So if you can speak to the issue, I think that would probably be the best. Hi, I'm Carl. My, uh, I live. Um, I'm living with uh, bipolar. And I'm attending Ryerson University to obtain my Bachelor of Commerce degree. Uh, affordable housing is important to me because I have a limited and low income. I have calculated that to afford a one-bedroom apartment today, one must make at least $75,000 a year. I'm paying only five seventy-eight dollars uh, per month for a one-bedroom unit uh, because when I moved here, uh, a relative of mine uh, owned the building, so I was able to get uh, uh, pay that, that about about that market price, right? So that that price, so below market value. Uh, uh, so uh, it was affordable uh, ten years ago, uh, and uh, so and it's still affordable now where I'm living, right? So, but what what I'm just get, trying to get at is that that um, uh, uh, that where I'm living right now, the new landlord. Uh, I have a lighting fixture that needs. I told. I, I asked them to uh, to get uh, to replace uh, because the lighting fixture is um, is uh, not giving adequate light, and they haven't responded. The landlord hasn't responded. Uh, I, su I suspect that the landlord would rather have me move out so he can renovate it and offer the apartment at a current market value. So that's what I'm suspecting. So. So right now I receive ODSP, which is about $1,100, but need to borrow 500 interest-free money from my, my uncle every month to live comfortably. Uh, so that's like $1,600 a month that I, I, I can live fairly comfortably with. But it's getting, it's getting more expensive now. Everything in Toronto is getting expensive, especially food. So I'm more and more needing to rely on places that give free meals. Um, keeping up with this changing economy is very challenging. So. I recommend that all levels of government provide more supports to help me overcome the challenges that I face and make zoning uh, affordable uh, for affordable units in the city. So I can move around, uh, you know, in my career I can move, uh, you know, where I need to, close to close to work, right? So close to work. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, hello. Um, my name is Ana Teresa Portillo. Uh, I work as the community benefits organizer with Parkdale People's Economy at Parkdale Activity Recreation Centre. We published the Parkdale Community Benefits Framework in November 2018, a 17-month-long participatory planning process from which minimum standards for equitable development in the areas of decent work, affordable housing, affordable commercial space, community assets, and equitable, equitable process were articulated. The Parkdale Community Benefits Framework follows the work of the Toronto Community Benefits Network and the first ever community benefits agreement that was signed in Los Angeles in 2001 for the Laker Stadium, where racialized Latino and black communities organizing for fair wage ordinances formed Los Angeles Alliance for a New Economy and were able to intervene in an unequitable development and win one of the most comprehensive community benefits agreement to date, a legal contract that centered community decision making while including monitoring and enforcement powers the Parkdale Community Benefits Framework follows this work by centering communities that have been historically and continuously economically and politically marginalized, and centering value and community-driven processes. I would like to take this opportunity to share the Affordable Housing Inclusionary Unit recommendations put forward in the Parkdale Community Benefits Framework as minimum standards for equitable development. The framework recommends that all private residential developments greater than eight stories be required to build 
30% permanently affordable units on the total number of units and not simply on the density increase. All private residential developments less than eight stories be required to build a minimum of 20% permanently affordable housing on the total number of units and not simply the density increase. Out of those inclusionary units, we recommend 20% be accessible, 30% be two bedrooms, 10% be three bedroom units. The framework also recommends that the inclusionary units include a range of affordability depths. 40% be deeply affordable, supporting community members on fixed incomes, shelter allowance, or rent geared to income. 30% be very affordable, from 60 to 80% average market rent. And 30% be affordable, from 80 to 100% average market rent. I see from the citywide consultation and communication summary that the committee has taken note of the public's disappointment with the inclusionary zoning policy directions that were proposed. The attack on tenant rights, increasing homelessness, increasing food prices, and decreasing availability of decent work with living wages require decisive and courageous action. I empathize, I empathize with the difficult position councillors find themselves in. Bill 108, in particular, the implications of the new called, the new so-called Community Benefits Authority is a looming unknown. The pressure from the ever-increasing powerful and influential private development sector, paralyzing. I believe that the urgency caused by the financialization and commodification of our homes and our communities at the hands of private developers has not fallen on deaf ears. There is an urgent need for the city and this committee to reflect the needs of healthy and caring communities boldly and unapologetically, contesting the pressures of compliance. This work can never be called redundant or counterproductive even if it is strike down by an unjust actor or actors. I thank you for your time and your championing of meaningful, affordable housing initiatives. Thank you. Thank you. Let's see. Thank okay. So I, just, I just wanted to quickly conclude by saying um, in May, there was a Toronto Star article that came out that we were all very, that reflected the city's excitement that against the looming threat of Bill 108, um, the councillors here, and notably Anna, you, uh, said that we are going to forge ahead and we can't wait the, the two years or more that this would set us back. And there was a poll done within that actual, um, within that article that showed that only a fifth of Torontonians would have disagreed with on that. So I'm, I'm really confident that we're going to keep moving forward with this in that spirit. And I know that all of Toronto's got your back in that. Great. Thank you. Any questions? Councillor Wong Tim. Uh, yes, and thank you for the deputation. I'm sorry that the uh, the audio video didn't work uh, at this point in time, um, but uh, but your your presentation was very coherent. I think it's very powerful. The message is uh, uh, is that we need to move with greater urgency, um, and I believe what you're saying is uh, don't slow down. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yes. Do not, That's correct. do not wait for the, the regulations that may not be coming anytime soon from the province. Is that correct? That's correct. Thank you. That's correct. And explicitly, there's a second round recommendation of two that says the committee direct the city planning report staff report back at the earliest possible date with draft IZ official plan policies. Once provincial regulations on the new community benefits authority have been issued, I would like that part to be redacted. Yeah. We, we would like that last Excuse part. Me. Yeah, so we need to put a period after the word yes. official plan policies, full stop, and delete everything else behind that. Yes. Yeah. That's, that's the recommendation for your community, from, from, this, from your group. That and just a, a boisterous rebuttal of this attempt to bind us at an important moment. 
with other municipalities around the Board. province. And is the concern that if we stand back and wait for the regulations from the province to be uh, issued first, uh, we'll be then negotiating from a position of weakness? as opposed to forging ahead and saying this is what the City of Toronto and its residents have stated it wants and this is what we will stand to fight for. Yes, we have to confront this gesture of compliance and have, making us feel as though we have to fit into a predetermined box that someone is telling us from above. So yes, we need to take a strong, courageous position forward and really reflect the needs and what the community and community consultations have been indicating. And, and recognizing that what you're suggesting is contrary to the, the city staff's advice, which is to wait and see, because I think the concerns are they don't want to jump ahead, um, draft something, and then, and then have to walk back on it. Um, you're suggesting a, an alternative route is to, regardless of whether um, uh, what, what the outcome of the regulations are, the details we will sort out later, uh, is that we should still draw that line in the sand and say these are the things uh, in the IZ policy that we must have and this is what we must stand and fight for, regardless of what the regulations will say, which, which could end up gutting the draft uh, official plan policies. It wouldn't be going on the back step because we okay. want to be moving forward with a Made in Toronto inclusionary zoning policy even when these bums get kicked out in two years. And I don't see that as, as being a waste of our resources to boldly move forward but to know what Toronto wants for inclusionary zoning. And will this give us an opportunity, assuming that we, we take your course of action, to, to socialize the, the, the details of the IZ uh, policy, to go out to communities to tell them this is what we need to stand and fight for, recognizing that there will be a fight ahead of us? Does that give us that opportunity if we are clear about what it is that we want? Because right now, those of us who are in the room and who have been paying attention to this report will know what's in the report. Um, but the details are still not before us, not even from the province, but we haven't sorted out those details uh, internally yet. Um, is it, does it give us a better, are we in a stronger fighting position despite the fact that this is a David and Goliath fight? But are we even a stronger David uh, if we put the policies out first? I think you're right. If we put the policies out first and draw that line in the sand, what we'll be doing is actually having meaningful consultation with folks. And because it will, the policies will be actually reflecting what people's needs are. If we wait until Bill 108 comes forward and try to socialize the IZ afterwards, it'll be a policy that's foreign to folks here in the community and it doesn't reflect their needs. So it wouldn't make much sense and we'd be much more powerful to situate ourselves and ground ourselves in people's real lived, uh, real lived realities. And yes, nothing will raise the profile more of this issue um, than pursuing it in this way than straight up against the province. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your questions, Councillor. Any other questions? Yeah. Councillor Fletcher. Um, I don't know, you're aware that when the city owns land and it's part of a development that we have an ability to basically undertake our own uh, inclusionary zoning. Have you been aware of any of those where the city's owned any land and you've been able to uh, intervene to get affordable housing into a development in your area or any other areas of town? Well, in our area, um, we just, um, after many years, um, had the city buy an LCBO site. Right. And my understanding is that there's a good chance we're going to get all social housing on that for people right. with, with mental health chattens, 40 units. So we're really excited about the next step. And, um, and absolutely, I think that all of so the city-owned land sites we have should Are there any other pieces of land that you know? I'm asking about other pieces of land, like little pieces, uh, front of parking authority, any, any piece of city land. It's a 14-acre lot in Keyside. I'd like to see some oh, affordable housing. Oh, let's talk on. about that. Um, <laughs> do, you, uh, do you support uh, 1.5 uh, as a so-called affordable housing target? As you know, that's the proposal on Keyside for supposedly 40% affordable, and that's to have 1.5% of affordable rent. So it wouldn't just be 80, it would be a one and a half <coughs> times the affordable. I'm assuming you don't support that as a model. 
I don't think we need a trillion dollar uh, surveillance firm to help us build the affordable housing that we, we already know we can build. Uh, I think we need to be building up our cooperative housing sector and our nonprofit developers to make use of the precious assets we have. And I think that that, among many other sites, is a great opportunity to begin doing so. So you're aware that the value of that 12 acres is $500 million? I, I am. I am. Are you? I am. Question mark, you are. Are you aware of how many affordable housing units could be built on that site uh, if it wasn't going for other purposes? That, do you surprised to hear it's 2,800? I'm surprised that uh, such a small proportion of that will actually be affordable to the, you know, 250,000 renter households who are on the lower half of. I think of I'm asking rentals. a different question. Are you aware that if that if that project wasn't what it is, but it was for affordable housing on the waterfront, there would be 2,800 affordable houses could be built on those 12 acres. Were you aware of that before I told you? That doesn't surprise me, I'm not aware. Yeah. And that would be a good thing or a bad thing in your mind? To build 20, I, I wanna maximize the number of social housing units there. And if that's the max, uh, I, I haven't seen- the I don't mean from studies. their proposal, I mean if, that is not in the current proposal, as you're very well aware. It, that sounds a lot better than the Google proposal to me, if that's what you're Thank you. I also wanted to add in the Parto Community Benefits Framework, one of our recommendations is that on publicly owned land, there be 100% um, social housing developed. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I do have a, a couple of questions. So. Um, other, when I talk to people from other cities, one of the things that they keep advising us is uh, the financial model, that it's the most important thing because in order to get units in, as part of the inclusionary zoning, we need to have buildings being built. And so things have to be feasible. Are you aware that we have to provide a financial uh, feasibility impact study as part of this bylaw? I, I'm very aware that our leverage in this moment is saying, yes, you can go continue making a profit by, say, tripling, quadrupling more the density on this land, but we want you to forego some of those super profits so that we can include affordable housing, yes. But the, the, what I've heard from staff is that they would like to know what the community benefit charge is going to be to calculate that properly, to take as much for us for affordable housing as possible. Would you agree that that is a wise thing, that we need to make sure that we take as much as we possibly can. You know, it's that fine, that middle line that you need to push, push until you can't no more. That's what you want us to do, correct? I'm sure you can agree with me that whatever cap we're going to see from this government in terms of rolling together development charges, Parkland and Section 37, is not going to be the maximum amount that we can make developers forego profits while still having a reasonable incentive to move forward. I think that it will be much, much less. And that's why I think we need to go forward and show what that maximum could be and then stake out the terrain of the fight for when they try to sell us that we can only do a third of that or a quarter of that. And you are aware that the only appeal process for this is actually the minister. There's no appeal process. Only the minister can actually appeal this. I'm, I'm very aware okay. that, that, that in doing so, we need to build public profile for this and work with other municipalities so that that appeal will be taken seriously, just like the retroactive cuts were, just like autism yeah. were. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I have one more speaker. Thank you. I think that's it. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Loretta Fisher. Hi, Loretta, you have five minutes. Thank you. My name is Loretta, and I am currently an Acorn Scarborough member. Approximately 10 years ago, I lived in a condo for almost 14 years where I brought up my kids. Um, in a great neighborhood with other condo owners, we thought we were condo owners, but we were rudely, um, until we were rudely run evicted and given repair costs of 15 to 18,000 on top of our rent to pay before two years. 
Uh, most of our small condo neighborhoods uh, could not afford this, and our homes were stolen in this way. It was a slow and painful process. I had to move to a basement apartment and lived there for about five years, and then I was renovicted again. Now I live in another basement apartment with the very real probability of being renovicted again. It's a recurring nightmare for me, for a lot of people. Um, apparently it's written into the law that the landlords can just tell us that we can, that they're fixing things and then we have to move. Where am I going to move next time that will be affordable? And where are all the ladies in my friend's apartment building at Birchmount and Finch going to move that is affordable? The landlord of their building put in new elevators, new lobby floors, new windows, etc. Nothing wrong with the old ones, but now it's new, and the rents for these ladies and their families are going up next year. The increase is almost $1,000. How is this a safe environment for anyone? I can attest from personal experience that the stress is devastating while just waiting for the ax to fall. It's the same as being in a hurricane, with the end result dragging my belongings to a shelter. So Acorn and myself are urging you to keep up, to keep working on inclusionary zoning so human beings in Toronto can actually live affordably. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much. Oh, one question, one question, Councillor Fletcher. I'm over here. Oh. I, um, uh, are you aware that on the 20th of November, we have a special meeting about rent evictions here at 7 o'clock? November Any, 20th? Pardon me? Yes. This November, November 20th? Just coming up next week. No, I thought uh, you told me about something about on November the 15th, but it's the 20th? It's November 20th, 20th. at 7 okay. o'clock for uh, about rent evictions to see. I would very much like you to come to express uh, how you feel at that meeting. Oh, okay. And to let everybody else know that's going to happen. Uh, and thank you very much for coming today. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. And now, Alejandra, you ready? Okay. Last speaker. Not build as fast as they can renovate. Okay. So, good morning. So, it's very difficult to preach to the choir because uh, all you that are here, councillors, has been with ACORN and many uh, actions have been with us and with our tenants. Um, so I know that you get what we're talking here about. I know that you really care. But uh, I'm going to say my spiel is still, even though I know that you, I know that you understand and we know that you understand. But, um, I know you are very concerned, or many of you are very concerned what the province is going to say uh, for the, the law ahead, but I, I'm going to tell you something that um, is not measured by numbers, but is uh, the well-being of the city as a whole, as a soul. Uh, we are in a democracy, and we cannot uh, give in with the bully of our premier. We are in a democracy. So I want to start to say my, my, my deput, my deputy, de, how you say it? My deputy presentation with fight, 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 fight. Yes, yes, yes. We are in a city right now that is lacking of hope. I come in from Bogota, a city of 12 million people, and what I see, uh, uh, if we don't care right now, this is what is going to happen to Toronto. What is happening right now in Bogota is chaos. Why? Because there's a lot of gentrification, because housing people were separated to the outs of the city because they didn't have uh, the money to pay. So if we don't do this inclusionary zoning right, we're going to suffer in the future, and I know that you are very sensible, and you say, well, if we don't do it, how we see that, that the, uh, may, um, our premier are going to, or we are expecting, well, we're going to have zero. 
But I prefer, or we prefer at this point in time, we have been suffering so much, we prefer that you go uh, with all uh, your strength and do it right. So ACON has been involved with IC since 2005. We have been in all consultations uh, since that time to now. IC has become a campaign very dear to our heart. And for telling you the truth, I only uh, had a one child, but I see become my second child. The problem is that we push, we push, but this baby doesn't come out in the way that we want it. <laughs> so we know that the city uh, didn't like to hear that we're in a crisis, but again, we had to see this is a crisis. And, um, and I know that uh, the sensible thing to do, or we know that the sensible thing to do is to take advantage of the EIC to the max. So we did a public consultation, or you guys did a public consultation, and the public consultation agreed on these three points that ACON has been pounding all the time, and is uh, that we need this, this uh, the time should be forever. Uh, the IC should be applied to the whole entire building, not only to the density and uh, the percentage should be between 20 to 30 percent. Uh, and the consultation doesn't show really how much was, but we don't know is because maybe it was bigger than 30 percent. This is why you don't show it. I don't know what is the reason. But we are asking between 20 to 30 percent of the IC. Um, and, um, the thing is, you want to, oh, oh, I heard that you want to stall it a little bit, but uh, every week we are losing units. And again, we cannot give, uh, give, uh, give in to the procedures of our premier, because again, we are in a democracy. So I think so this is all that I had to say. Thank you so much. No questions? Uh, can I say something? She's so I, good. She's already, she's already taking over. She, she's, she's, you know, <laughs> she knows the process. <laughs> um, Any questions of Alejandra? Councillor Fletcher. Sure. Yeah, I, I want to ask a question again, and um, I'm sure you'll tell everybody about the rent evictions meetings because there's people here worried about staying in their housing as well as making sure we build new affordable housing. And you know that many of the rents that people are paying are more affordable than new affordable housing. But I just want to ask you about how, um, while we're waiting for this to roll out, how strong should the city be about our properties, city-owned properties or agency-owned properties, where they're going to go into a new development? How tough should we be to insist on a very high percentage of affordable housing, deeply affordable housing. Well, you say it's our own land, isn't it? Pardon? You, you say it's our yeah. own so land. We have housing now sites. There's been uh, how we can achieve that on right now on properties that we have, whether they're TCHC properties, whether they're uh, TCC properties, whether they're Toronto Parking Authority properties, whether they're city direct properties, we have an ability there, if a developer wants to build something, to insist on certain things. Should we insist strongly on affordable housing on those sites? Of course, we should. We actually, we had their double power, isn't it? Because it's our land. Is, uh, and really and truly what is going to happen is that the developers only going to make 5%, but it's in our land. So they normally do 20%. Well, let's, let's, let's do 5%. It's time that they really um, get a little bit because they have been taking and taking from us. So it's time that they get a little bit uh, more. And yeah, I agree that we should get stronger with the affordability. And we should have our staff focus very strongly when they're looking at planning applications, whether it's in Scarborough, Etobicoke, North York, Toronto, East York, on that concept. City property, include affordable housing as part of the development or don't sell it. Totally agree. 
So would you be surprised to hear at Toronto Parking Authority that we can't, would you agree this can never happen again? That a five-story garage on Cumberland was sold to a developer. There's a 40-story and a 60-story building, 100 stories at that site, and not one affordable unit was placed there. Are you aware of that? Well, this is, this is shameful and it's, it's I was really surprised, or we were really surprised when this happened, because how come in a city that needs so much housing this happens? So this never will happen. This should never happen. Are you watching all the development applications that come in? Well, to make sure that if it's partly city land, is somebody doing that, keeping us going to community council in Scarborough and other places and watching to say increase city land, increase, make sure you put enough affordable housing on there because once it's gone, it's gone. So um, I'm just going to count on all you folks to really watch closely. It doesn't have as much to do. This is our own internal inclusionary zoning. While we're getting this other piece right, we have to get this right. Very good, very good. And, and you should be taking note of that because it's a, it's a very good thing to do. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Yes. Councillor Bradford. Uh, thanks very much, and thanks, Salandra, for the deputation. I appreciate that. Um, I think we've heard a lot this morning um, from many of the deputants about the challenges right now on the city needing to take the lead on the IZ file, um, despite the uh, legislative changes at the province. Um, I want to park that for a second and take it back to a higher level. There's been conversations around Charter City and the City of Toronto looking for more autonomy from the province. And I think this is really emblematic of those challenges. Uh, we're trying to move forward with planning policy, really important tools like inclusionary zoning, and yet uh, you know, we're kind of going to the province and asking for permission. Do you think on the housing file and the planning file in particular that the City of Toronto needs more autonomy, more separation from the province on that? This should be something fantastic if we can get it, for sure. Okay. For sure, because look at how we are, because without not even going uh, happening, we are, we don't know where to go. So yeah, thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Ready to go? Great. Thank you. So that concludes our speakers. Questions of staff, Councillor Layton. Yes, thank you very much. Just, just a couple questions to confirm the timeline, because it seems to only go back on the, on the chart here to 2018. In 2010, there was an update given to Council about inclusionary zoning. In 2015, inclusionary, uh, Council instructed staff to start preparing a bylaw for inclusionary zoning in preparation of the province, correct? Well, I, my, my timeline starts in April 2018 when we got the power from the province. So, but in 2015, Council instructed staff, planning staff, to start preparing a bylaw. There wasn't a wait for the province, it was start preparing the bylaw. So my understanding is that there was a request from City Council to initiate include the inclusionary zoning process. However, we did not receive the authority from the province to actually uh, embark on that process until April 2018. So no work was done between 2015 and 2018, despite the fact that Council instructed staff to begin examining what an inclusionary zoning bylaw would look like. I can get the language, I'm, I'm, like I, I, I just didn't bother bringing it up. I wrote the motion, so I know that it was there. In the absence of uh, provincial direction, we did start to look at revising our housing policies that would look like an inclusionary zoning framework, but we never advanced it to the point of bringing it forward. Okay, I'm not sure that was the language that was written from council, so we'll have to confirm that before the council meeting. Um, in 2018, council recommitted to an inclusionary zoning, uh, to, to going down the road of inclusionary zoning. That's correct. And then in April of that year, the province, after at their second attempt, passed, re gave regulatory authority to the city. That's correct. And then, but they, they, they gave us a bunch of requirements that we had to fulfill down that path. Yes, there are a number of things that we need to do before we can bring it forward. So until Bill 108 in April of 2019, 
we were working on achieving what the requirements were from the previous government's mandate for inclusionary zoning. That's correct. And when do, when do we expect that the province will enact the regulations around Bill 108 that will allow us to proceed? Through the chair, my understanding is their intent this fall. And sometimes the, this, sometime this fall. The most uh, that I have is this fall. Now, I, before I ask what we think those parameters might look like, I'd, I'd like to ask just very quickly, you had the folks from Boston and New York City in to talk about, and they, and they, they said this financial model was really important. They said their, it was paramount to get the numbers paramount. Right. Paramount. Now, did their councils adopt the recommendations from their staff, or did they modify them? Uh, my understanding is, is that the city of Boston's inclusionary zoning is done through a, a mayor's requirement at this point. It's actually not embedded in their, um, their zoning bylaw. And in New York City, there was um, modifications made to the uh, staff recommendations that were brought forward. To make them stronger than the staff recommended through the financial model, correct? Uh, to modify certain aspects of the framework. Yeah. And would we call New York City a success? I think that they, uh, they consider that the, the work that they have done in the last 17, 18 years on inclusionary zoning successful. And did Boston, uh, did, did the mayor adopt the, the recommendations that came out of the model, their financial model, or did he, he or she th strengthen them? Again, it was just a mayor's direction to implement sure. inclusionary zoning, so the updated analysis is actually going forward now, so it's, it hasn't been before council. It hasn't been before, but in New York City, they did strengthen the, the, the financial yes. model. Thank you. Um, what parameters do we expect to come from the province? Will they set the rate, the areas, the depth, the longevity, and the level of affordability? What we're waiting for is a regulation from the province related to the community benefits charge to understand what the, that rate is in order us, for us to go back and properly calculate, properly do the financial analysis to understand what's possible in terms of inclusionary zoning. So, so essentially, and, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, the province are going to tell us how much money we can get from developers. We're not going to be saying how much money do we need from developers. No one's I, I think that... I would frame it as that understanding that direction from the province in terms of Bill 108 and the community benefits charge is critical to us being able to go back and update our pro forma analysis for, in terms of all of the inputs that we put into our pro forma analysis for inclusionary zoning for us to understand where there may be opportunities. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other question? Any uh, other people to ask questions? Councilor Wong Tam? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, with respect to um, some of the early uh, comments that have come from the community, um, there seems to be um, a gap between what the community has said largely and what the staff have then drawn as a conclusion. Uh, so, for example, the affordability period, uh, members of the community through co public consultation said that they want to have the longest period uh, possible, uh, many of them suggesting 99 years uh, or permanent affordability. The staff have come back and said the units will remain affordable at 25 percent. Uh, what was... Um, what was the, uh, the shift internally as, as policy staff were reviewing the public consultation of, of asking for 99 years and, and longer, and then the, the outcome that you've drawn, which is to, to then put forth a recommendation of 25-year affordability period, period? What happened there? We actually haven't put forward a recommendation yet. As you may recall, our policy directions from May were 25 years. We've undertaken very robust consultation. We did the the majority of people gave us feedback that they wanted longer, preferably permanent affordability. And again, as we go back now and revisit all of those comments and all of the the um, feedback that we got and we input that into our pro forma analysis, we sort of have to push and pull on all these different things we heard. So we, we have no final recommendation. Okay, so I would just, so sorry, Councillor, I would just add that that's recommendation one in the report is yeah. that we actually uh, inform the, our final recommendations based on the consultation, taking the consultation into, into account. So then to clarify, then there could be a big shift uh, in what was originally proposed in the policy direction and where staff will ultimately end based on the consultation uh, outcomes. Is that correct? That's correct. And so if the draft policy does go back out, even with, in the absence of 108, recognizing that you do have some numeric uh, holes that you have to plug into your performa, but let's just say you could 
you could probably take a, a, an educated guess of what the development lobby is asking the province for best worst case scenario for the residents uh, what could be a best case scenario based on the things that we believe uh, could uh, help us uh, bridge that uh, affordability housing gap um, and then somewhere in between the most likely case let's just say you were able to use the the, the computers in a way that would give you some projections on educated uh, informed guess does that mean if you went out with those scenarios um, uh, that you could still solicit uh, feedback from the community on the draft um, proposal, the draft policy, to ask the community to respond to the perhaps three or four options. Would you, is, that an, is that a possibility here? I think the short answer is, is it a possibility? Yes. The risk is, is that it's not a, it's not a fully informed or necessarily accurate um, um, consultation that we would do that may require us to come back around again. Meaning that if that process, uh, if, if the bill change, if, sorry, if the regulation changes come back and it's, and, and it's nothing captured in your, in your best, case, best guess scenario, um, which is really what the development lobby is asking for, which is little to no changes. They don't want uh, inclusionary zoning at all. Like, let's just assume that's what's going to come out. Um, and the community says that's, that's a model we absolutely reject. Um, but you've given, they've given you some very clear indication of, of, of how they prefer a, a, around the best case and most likely case scenario. Uh, we still need to go back out to do further consultations, what you're saying. So that will be the third, third round. Is, is that yeah, what Yes, I'm essentially, yes. And, and that would chair, be ab I, Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, through the chair, perhaps I can um, add to this. Assuming, in terms of some timelines, assuming the province comes forward with its regs this fall, we will go back and do the financial analysis that we need to do to be supportive of, of the direction we're going. We're going to take the comments that we receive through the consultation, and then we're going to come back with varied policies that reflect what we've heard, what we'll hear from committee, um, what we'll continue to hear, no doubt, and then come back. And that's where we're hoping to go out with a final proposed policy framework. And if the province does not release its regulations, its detailed regulations by the anticipated day of autumn 2020, um, and we don't, we don't see these regulations for, for some time, what happens then? 19. For 2019. We don't want to give them No, we don't want to give them that. But, but what happens then? Well, um, I would suggest one of the pieces of work that we will continue to advance, which is protected major transit station areas, because this is one of the areas that we have to, uh, up where we can apply inclusionary zoning. So we will continue to advance that piece of the framework, because that's a cru crucial component, because we can only apply inclusionary zoning within a PMTSA, which is approved by the minister, uh, a development permit system or where the minister directs. So we will continue to advance that piece of the framework in the interim. So therefore, work doesn't stop simply because we're not proceeding without the regulations. Through the chair, that's correct. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor. Thank you. I, I just want to pursue what Councillor Wong Tam was asking a little further. So we did a model. We, we brought in some consultants to do a model when we envisioned that there would be inclusionary zoning citywide and we could just draft our own bylaw, right? But, yes, that's yeah. right. Yeah, and that model uh, looked at the sensitivity of the market in different parts of the city and if you put this kind of cost on, uh, you, you know, you, you would stop development. You didn't put that much cost on, the development would go ahead and you get the units, right? That's correct. The some of the variables in that model were things like the percentage of affordability, the period of affordability, and the depth of affordability, right? Yes. Could we, um, based on the consultation that has been provided to us, where the public has told us we want more permanent affordability and deeper affordability, could we apply those changes to that model and present to us at council a sense of how many units of what type we could have got if we had been able to do the citywide bylaw. 
The challenge is, is that the uh, it would be based on Section 37 inputs and... I, I understand that, and, and I appreciate that I'm asking you to provide me with a hypothetical. But if I wanted to understand where we could have been if we had listened to the public in terms of how we designed the program... That's a good one. And the, pro you know, Premier Ford hadn't decided that the development industry was more important than the people who live in Toronto... Um, could we get a sense of what it would have produced? Yes, that's possible. Okay. Thank you. Can I... Oh, oh, oh. Hang on. Can I, I might just, have more. Can I just, sup plan. Can I just supplement that um, I, I think I heard you say council. And um, I, think I, I think the question was about running some models, mm -hmm. which if you're thinking that that's information that you would want at the next council meeting... First of all, this report isn't headed to the next council meeting. I understand. Um, so we would likely need some time with our consultant team uh, to run those models. I do have a further question. How much time would you need? Well, uh, I, I would imagine that we would... Oh, sorry, one sec. Two minutes. Look, two, we've been advised by our consultants that they would need two months. Two months. So February... Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, any other questions of staff? Uh, Councillor Fletcher. Yeah, I think um, just it's helpful to just talk a little bit about the major transit station assessments, where we're at with that. And I'm interested on the Crosstown, where the, um, what we've managed to achieve in future planning and current planning for the Eglinton Crosstown vis-a-vis -vis affordable uh, inclusionary zoning affordable units. So we're in the process right now of developing a work pro program um, on our MTSAs and bringing forward PMTSAs. Uh, in terms of what we've achieved across okay. the Eglinton Crosstown, we have the, um, in, through the Don Mills Crossing, um, we were able to secure affordable housing on the large site that has come through so far in that secondary plan area and through the Golden Mile secondary plan area right now that that work is being advanced and that work is not finalized yet. So I just want to go to the Golden Mile because that was the question to, to some of the deputants that have any of the applicate there's been applications along Eglinton East is that right? That's correct, and a number of the applications along the Golden Mile Secondary Plan area are actually large sites, and so therefore subject to our large site policy. And have those gone to Scarborough Community Council yet? No, they have not advanced. So um, that's all internal at the moment, and then there'll be a report that will go to Scarborough Community Council. Or has there been a preliminary report go to Scarborough Community Council? Uh, my recollection is there have been preliminary reports. And Sorry, they, I have or haven't? I didn't. There have. There have been preliminary reports. And that the large site policy application was identified. So um, I guess I'll just ask the chief planner now, given the amount of interest in inclusionary zoning from the public, and the fact that large sites under major transit stations, and that would include those along the Golden Mile and the large site policy, is there a way of engaging all of the people here who are very clear as to what their needs are in this conversation? Because when I asked people if they'd been to Scarborough, to the Eglinton East conversations, they hadn't been. So. That would be Scarborough Community Council, I believe. So is there some way to plug in the very interested public we have here today, many of whom actually have said they're from Scarborough? Uh, through the chair, the, the secondary plan for uh, the Golden Mile will be forthcoming, I believe, in the first quarter of 2020 to Scarborough Community Council. Uh, I, you'd have my under, undertaking, certainly, to have the staff there sit down with... Uh, who would like to be engaged in that, uh, in that process if they have not already been engaged because there has been a lot of consultation. But certainly if there are people who want to sit down and talk about how we're using the existing toolkit, which is the large site policy 
Section 37. These are the existing tools that we have to secure affordable housing. I'd be happy to do that. And then I would just add that as the IZ policy and approach comes online in the next year or so, uh, you, you can expect that the city would be looking at its major transit station areas and updating various planning frameworks to make sure that we have uh, the ability to use that tool uh, uh, across the, the geography of the city where the province permits it to be used. So, but along Eglinton, you're going to have two things. You're going to have stations and a large site toolkit. Is well, that existing, right? existing policy is the large site toolkit, and ultimately we'd be shifting to an inclusionary zoning approach where we'd be capturing uh, affordable housing in proximity to major transit station areas across the city where, uh, where the, the direction of Bill 108 permits it. And that's 20% of, what is the uh, toolkit allow on a large site? On a large site it's 20%, yes. So just explain that 20% of the housing built on the large sites on Eglinton East must be affordable. Do I have that's, that right? That's the existing official plan framework that we are advancing through more detailed secondary plan policies and ultimately uh, when an application comes along, we would secure that percentage in those development applications. I, I don't know if any of your staff here have been at Scarborough Community Council, but can I ask have any staff here been at Scarborough Community Council for these preliminary reports and conversations? Actually, uh, I'm just noticing that we have the director in planning at Scarborough here, Paul Zuliani, who can maybe help us there. Well, my question is, uh, have there been deputants, as we've had here today, so articulate, come and speak to those preliminary plans and the affordable housing components on the large sites, to your recollection? Through the chair, uh, we've brought forward uh, uh, at least six to nine preliminary reports on applications within the Golden Mile Secondary Plan Study area. Um, at those meetings, uh, we did not have deputations um, from the community uh, indicating that there were concerns or issues or needs to be addressed regarding affordable housing. However, the consultation sessions certainly have uh, raised that issue in the community but there are no deputations. So I'm just going to go back to the chief planner. Six to nine preliminary reports, that means six to nine large sites, 20% on each site. Would you be willing to, um, as you've mentioned, perhaps through the chair of the committee, uh, gather together those who are interested in that 20%, what the sites are and the preliminary reports, so they would be ready to engage at Scarborough Community Council when those came forward? Uh, short answer is yes. I did read there's 22,000 units that are in the pipeline on Eglinton East, so quickly, that would be 4,400, I think, yes, affordable units that would be targeted on Eglinton East, minimum. And uh, if you have that undertaking, then I think I'll probably move something or try to, uh, the, the deputants here, after figure out how you can get your briefing and I'll speak about that when I speak. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Bradford. Uh, there's been a lot of questions so just going to clarify a couple things. Um, I think what we're hearing from the deputations uh, and folks today is that uh, we don't want to take a back seat while the province is working on the regulations and the parameters around the community benefit charges. Uh, it sounds like we're going to see some motions related to that. Um, so maybe to the chief planner, how can we give assurance that we're doing the maximum possible work leading up to the CBC regulations so that when they are released we can bring those policies to the next council meeting. Uh, is that possible or how would that work? Well, as uh, staff have indicated through the chair in uh, answers so far, um, and certainly that's been the, the direction since uh, 2018, is to advance in every possible way uh, our readiness for implementing the uh, inclusionary zoning power. Um, I'm sensitive to taking up the time on your, your time, but I do have an explanation of three critical pieces that are 
legislatively or from a regulatory point of view required here to literally stand up inclusionary zoning three legs of that stool so I'm happy to do that but I'm sensitive to other questions you may have I, well I, I, yeah no I think that's fine the, basically where I'm going is you know whatever the CBC amount is is there a range of CBC values or scenarios that we can prepare for to help advance the policy work now but if you want to think about that and then address your three pillars um, that would be great and that's it for me so I mean, staff can maybe respond to the CBC values. Uh, I don't, they're working maybe on something else right now. I don't know if they heard the question. The, uh, the values, that, the inputs into the CBC that would be of concern to us in making a calculation that is defensible and financially feasible. We can look at various scenarios, absolutely, um, and to, to try to get a sense of the, the, the sensitivity of different, of different um, components of an IZ framework, um, but again, they still, at the end of the day, would be um, sort of scenarios or possibilities that would need to be reconfirmed once the regs came out. I'm sorry, I didn't quite hear the whole question. Um, okay, so I have like a lot of basic questions initially about what are those discussions like with the province? Like, I would think that right now at the table, there's a discussion where here's sort of the scenarios, here's where we might land, here's what we're contemplating for a CBC framework, and then I would think that you would be able to take those sort of scenarios and run the analysis on that to inform our thinking on this, but um, I, maybe that isn't the case. I mean, I, I didn't want to go down that rabbit hole. I, I wouldn't characterize it as an iterative discussion. Okay. Uh, there's no ongoing discussion. There is... Um, we're waiting for regulations to be published. We've, we've formally provided input, as right. have municipalities across the province, uh, including large municipalities like Mississauga and Hamilton, who we've been in direct com uh, conversation with about our approach. But um, it, it is a period of, you know, we comment and we, we, uh, right. we wait. Okay, so maybe just take us through the three pillar piece um, and that's good. Yeah, so if, if I may, uh, through the chair, the, uh, it's important literally to stand this up that we consider uh, a couple of matters, and I appreciate it's complicated, and this is certainly with full uh, you know, empathy to the issues that have been raised today, but it is uh, imperative that we consider these things. One is the, uh, the major transit station areas. People have heard that uh, IZ can only be deployed in major transit station areas. And, uh, or, or in an area where there's a development permit system. Uh, so that is one leg of the stool that, is, uh, that limits the geography, and some of the speakers noted that, that limits the geography of the application of IZ. That um, is subject to minister approval. So that's the where and the fact that uh, this city needs ministerial approval for that. Sorry, is this on the protected major, major transit? transit so we would have a conversation as a city with the province? On well, we, we firstly will be bringing forward a work plan on that in uh, the first quarter of 2020 to, uh, to advance that, but ultimately that's something that's subject to provincial approval and that covers the, ge the geography. Um, secondly, for, for IZ, as we've heard, we are developing a, a, an IZ official plan amendment that will set out in detail the approach and, and Councillor Wong Tam, for example, ask questions about how we're evolving that, that direction uh, to reflect uh, consultation. That OPA ultimately would come here and it, uh, it too would be sent to the province. However, it's, um, it, it uh, can be appealed to the LPAT uh, by the province. So there again, uh, whatever this city decides, this city council decides, uh, would be subject to appeal. Thirdly, and importantly, um, each and every protected management uh, station area, major transit station area, or may, maybe bundles of those, um, we would deploy the IZ in, in those. So you can imagine us deploying IZ in a grouping of transit station areas around Young and Eglinton, for example, or in the Golden Mile. Uh, each of those IZ bylaws would uh, be subject to ministerial appeal to the LPAT. So with each legs of the stool, or each legislative or regulatory steps that this city has to take, they are all subject to 
some variety of either ministerial and or referral to the LPAT. So it is a highly conditioned process that we have to go through, and that is why we have emphasized uh, to you that we um, need uh, as a critical input an understanding, a clear understanding of the community benefits regulations because the financial feasibility and ultimately the, you know, the argument that we're going to put forward, our best foot forward, rests on uh, the, uh, the, uh, the good work that we can do to defend it with, together with our uh, financial impact consultants. So I, again, I appreciate that's very complicated, but there are at least three main legislative legs to this, and a critical underpinning is the financial feasibility analysis. Thank you. Uh, and <laughs> Councillor Fletcher. Yeah, this is an important issue, so. Yeah, so we're just, right now we are in this IZ process, and we're having that deep conversation, but I think one of the things I'm trying to draw out today is there are other processes that are also in play immediately where we need maximum community engagement to achieve maximum affordable housing. And one of those examples was the Eglinton East, which there are applications and preliminary reports. I'm going to ask, are there any others outside of the 11 Housing Now sites that you are aware of? Sorry. <laughs> or do you want to come back well, when you bring that back? Perhaps. Say, here's a list of those sites that we also know, here's where they are in the city, and here's why they are immediately available for a discussion about affordable housing. So, so through the chair, this, this committee receives an annual update from the division on its work program. You'll be receiving that report in January. Uh, we will be highlighting in that report uh, completions in 2019 and our work program, work, uh, work in progress. Um, I think we can uh, try to identify in all of those various studies where we're undertaking an oper or where there is an opportunity, if you will, for uh, an engagement on affordable housing. I think that's something that we can try to facilitate. So we will we'll include something like that in our January report. So that would be great. So that would be any major large sites that are under development, any major pieces of um, city-owned or agency-owned land that is under discussion. And I would include the... Danforth Garage at that point, which seems to have gone quiet as far as affordable housing is concerned and moving that along. Um, but maybe so I'm wrong. Yeah, no, okay. Is back. Okay, so. so then we'll also do that at Create. Um, so that would perhaps they could be here as well. There's lands that they have. There are small portions of lands that are out there that agencies have that are included in a development application, like I'm just going to mention 838 Broadview is one. There are, city has one acre of land at Keyside that still is our acre of land. So what would our request or requirement be around affordable housing there? I don't think we've articulated that. I'm just letting you know what I'm going to ask at, from the annual report, because I understand there is great interest, uh, maybe this is my speech, but you can include a number of these things. What's the question? You can include a number of these things plus options that we would have in order to achieve them. Uh, through the chair, our, the emphasis or the, the nature of our, of our work program report is identifying um, planning studies and other initiatives underway by the city planning division. I would suggest that um, you, th this could be supplemented by a request at the CREATO uh, board meeting for a similar kind of ask for lands that are being engaged in in development uh, that are under the auspices of Create TO or the city's real estate division. That might be a better way of getting at those other than through uh, uh, the city planning's work program. So just to clarify, um, perhaps you might like a letter from me to clarify exactly what I'm looking for. I 
sent to you and CREATO, but we have a number of identified sites on Eglinton. There may be a number of identified sites for the Ontario line. Um, and where are they? What are in play right now? Where are the preliminary reports? What planning staff would do? Those are not create TO sites, am I right? Those are privately owned large that, sites. That's correct. So distinguishing about the type of sites that are, are in play and who's doing what would be helpful in a January report. Would you be able to do that? Uh, through the Chair, I might be able to provide some commentary. Again, our January report emphasis is on the work program. It's not on the hundreds of development applications that we have across the city. So, so I think where we have a large development op application, I'll, I'll identify another one, Mr. Christie's, for example. Uh, we are deploying our existing policy framework, uh, so we would be looking at the large site policy. I think Carrie wants to comment as Can well. I just ask, is, uh, just before uh, Ms. Vumvakis, has there been a preliminary report at, for the Christie site, for the Parklawn site? Through, through the chair, not at this point in time. It's anticipated so, the first quarter. Uh, we're targeting January, February to this committee. It would come to this committee because it's employment conversion. Right. Um, yes, it should. And therefore, anyone who is signed up for inclusionary zoning today would be advised of that application coming forward in order to express their strong opinions about adding affordable housing on these large sites? Through the chair, they would be if they asked to be notified of the, the item. So um, they wouldn't know to be notified of that item. Perhaps it might be better done, Mr. Chief Good Planner, if this, was a, if this was a standalone report rather than in your annual report. Would that not be preferable? That was the last question. Well, if, uh, through the speaker, if the, if the question is about just getting an overall update on where we are able to uh, achieve affordable housing with our existing toolkit, um, and, you know, and I think through the questions you've identified several ways that that manifests itself, whether it be on a large site, whether it be a large application, or whether it be through a city initiated study, perhaps we can provide an update, some sort of an update report on what that looks like so that you have a better sense and so, so that the community has a better sense of where to engage and how to tap into those opportunities. I, th I think that thank would you. be a great I'll speak. Thanks. Okay, that concludes our questions. Uh, speaker is Councillor Matlow. Thank you. Uh, what I, uh, what I, what I, what I think came very uh, clearly through uh, the comments and the feedback that we received from residents from across the city with respect to inclusionary zoning is that this is about inclusionary zoning, but it's really about affordability. And if, you know, IZ is, is a tool to be able to enable us to achieve more affordable housing in the city. And there are many more. You know, the next item we're going to be, or one of the next items that we're going to be addressing is uh, rent safe and, you know, looking at ways to address uh, these fraudulent rent evictions and uh, uh, times that landlords abuse the uh, ability that they have to ostensibly move in family members, but really they're just doing it for a moment or they're not really doing it at all to get rid of tenants to hike the rents. Uh, it has everything to do with above the guideline rent increases that are often exploited by landlords because uh, uh, tenants find themselves in situations where they have much higher rents than they had ever budgeted for and had ever planned for just to, for the privilege of paying for somebody else's equity. Um, this has everything to do with what we asked uh, staff to review as well with respect to even what affordability means now and is it really just under the market rate or should we be looking at the fact that more and more renters are paying even more than 50 even 60 percent of their annual income into their monthly rent and that affordable housing as we call it today is no longer affordable housing for many many renters across our city so yes this is about iz but it's also about um affordability and how do we make this city more affordable for the majority of our residents? Um, how do we get there? Well, yes, we need to have committee meetings like this and council meetings and have discussions about what we are arguing for and demanding and requesting. But ultimately, and Councillor Bradford alluded to this earlier, uh, and this is why I wanted to speak, to continue the, I think, momentum that we have towards achieving a city charter. Because what do we keep what is the wall that we keep 
finding our heads being bashed against. We have to ask the province for virtually every single thing that we want to do. When we had the uh, recent uh, uh, tribulations with respect to the unilateral uh, public health and child care cuts, it was all about what the province would either give it or take it away. When our election was ripped up uh, in the midst of it, it was about what the province would, wanted to do on a whim. And I could just point to so many other examples of where we keep coming to the same problem. We spend so much energy and effort having these discussions here at City Hall. But really, the province is going to do what they want to do. We can put pressure, but ultimately it's their decision. So yes, we need to fight for inclusionary zoning. I would like to see it far greater than 5%. I'd like to see it go far further than transit nodes. I would like to see any area of our city where a new build is going to happen be subject to inclusionary zoning so that we're not begging uh, builders to uh, uh, be considerate to how people need to live in their affordability. But we're just saying this is the way it's going to be. This is how we're going to plan our city. These are the people we are serving, and that's the way it's going to be. We don't have that power. So I hope while we are asking for more abilities to implement inclusionary zoning, we also at the same time need to be demanding that we have the powers at the city level to provide real local accountable government so that we don't keep coming into the same frustration, the same situation over and over again. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Matlow. Councillor Layton. Yes, thank you very much. Um, more affordability, deeper affordability, longer affordable term. Yes. That is what we heard from the community when we did out when we went out and did public consultation. That is what we heard the city needs. I think all of us know that's what the city needs. The reality is for the last 20 years, the city has been waiting to implement inclusionary zoning. Certainly at least the last 10 years. Before many of us were city councillors, uh, councillor Councillor Vaughan put forward a motion saying, give us an update, 2010, right before the election. I don't think that update was ever given, but he asked for it. And then we had an election. In 2015, council gave direction to say, prepare an inclusionary zoning policy so that when the province moves, we can enact it. Now, the, the past provincial government didn't do us any favors in this regard. They waited to the end of a two-year majority term to first pass a set of recommendations that wasn't good enough, and many of us fought very hard to get them changed. And then they passed regulations with such a high bar, we still haven't been able to, to meet them in about a year and a half because of the studies that were required. We weren't able to achieve what the bar of the province had set. But at least they were allowing us to do more because this provincial government is narrowing it so much, the possibility of us implementing a policy that will make a difference. They're narrowing it so much that it's not clear we're gonna get anything at all. Now, why would we let them be in the driver's seat? Why would we let them dictate to us what we have to do rather than tell the people of Toronto and rather than tell the province what we want to do and what we can do. That's the problem I see here. I, I agree, eventually our, our regulation, our bylaw will have to fit the provincial model. It will have to, if we want to implement it, it will have to. But I don't think that we should wait to let the government tell us the, paper, the picture we want to paint. We should paint that picture ourselves. And if they want to take away, if they want to take away affordable units and have us continually miss this, the, the potential 2,500 units a year, I missed the second round of questions. I'm sure they got, got an updated number. Um, I, I, I don't think we want to be in that position to miss an opportunity to sketch out what a visionary inclusionary zoning policy could be, because I don't think the province will let us do it at the end of the day. And I'm, I'm worried that then the story will be, 
the city enacts a small inclusionary zoning policy rather than the city had a grid policy and the province took it away from us. Because that's essentially what they're doing here. We need to make sure that it's loud and clear this is what is possible and then have the province do what they will do and we can, we can go on fighting to try to make uh, our policy uh, a reality. I was, I was happy to hear though, and, and I know that we had experts down from Boston and New York City and I had heard that while using these financial models are critical, it's our job as elected officials to push that to say it's not just about the bottom line of the developers, it's also about how much a city values and puts an emphasis on building affordable housing. And New York City, their construction didn't die as a result. We have more cranes in the sky, yes, but no, the construction of, of, of units did not stop in New York City when council went beyond, when their council went beyond what was being recommended by staff. And, and push that, that, that bit of an extra mile. So I don't think we can afford to wait for the province. I would suggest that while we do make our policy compliant in the end, let's lead strong and let's get back in the driver's seat. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Layton. Uh, bringing, into, bringing into committee, who would like to, Councillor Perks. Thank you. Um, I'd like to begin by moving a motion. Uh, to direct the, the Chief Planner and Executive Director of City Planning to report to the Planning Housing Committee on February 12, 2020 on the potential number of units and level of affordability that may have been achieved by an inclusionary zoning policy based on the pre-108 policy framework and the feedback received through the public consultation. So, we are in a crisis in the City of Toronto. It is the single biggest crisis facing us as a government. Many say it's our transit system. Many say that you know it, it's it's some, our childcare system. No. Having a decent life begins with a decent place to live. This is the fundamental problem facing us as a city, as a community, and as a government. And we have been working on a range, a suite of tools. Next month, we expect to see uh, a big policy piece on what we're going to do generally in terms of affordable housing in the City of Toronto. We've established a subcommittee to work on trying to prevent rent evictions from happening, and we'll be discussing that soon. But there was also a piece around inclusionary zoning. And we had been working through, as Councillor Layton said, a path to getting there. On the path to getting there, we had a, a conversation where uh, planning staff gave some initial advice. Members of the community said, no, no, we want deeper affordability. We want a longer period of affordability. And just as we were getting to that work, the, pro the Premier of Ontario stepped in and stepped on us and said, no, the rights of developers are more important than solving that fundamental crisis in the City of Toronto of making sure that everyone has a safe place to live. And today, many of you came and said, we need to confront that head on. We need to challenge that the way that we challenged the province going after public health and the province going after childcare. The difference being though, when the province is taking away something we've already got, we can say it's this many dollars, it's this many childcare spaces, it's that public health thing. What we lack here is a clear picture of what Bill 108 took away from the future of Toronto. Right. And if the Premier of Ontario is going to run around telling everybody, I've learned my lesson, I'm a nicer guy now, I listen to people, I, I, I reverse my cuts, I'm not the big ogre that this Toronto City Council said I was, then we're going to have to prove it. We're going to have to put it right in the face of the Premier. This is what you took away. You took away a system that would have produced this many housing units every year into the future. Yeah. We need that information. Now, I've been told it's a, it's a difficult proposition to just run it in a week. Fair enough. We'll give the staff till February. And even if the province comes out with their regulations before February, 
we're not going to settle the question of inclusionary zoning by then because there will be developers who push back against whatever we do and we'll be in a process. But during that process, we will be able to stand up clearly and say, Doug Ford's favor to the development industry cost Toronto this. And that's what we need to do. We also need to make it clear to the mayor of Toronto that just because you cut a deal on transit doesn't mean we have a kinder, gentle, prov gentler provincial government. A kinder, gentler provincial government would actually develop policies that housed people in the city of Toronto. So we need, as a council, to have this information in front of us so we can have a clear fight, a clear fight about what's wrong with Bill 108, about whose interests are being protected by the provincial government, and what Torontonians want for their city. Thank you, Councillor Perks. Oh, okay. Uh, Councillor Fletcher. Um, I'm going to move a motion that Planning and Housing Committee direct the Chief Planner and Executive Director, City Planning, in collaboration with Create TO, to report to the Planning and Housing Committee on February 12, 2020, it just happens to be when we're hearing about these units, with a list of large sites or other sites where affordable housing could be created using our current and available tools. And that's our official plan tools and our land. So I'm happy to speak with you later and let you know uh, everything that I think should go there. This is a bigger housing question that we're talking about today. Inclusionary zoning is one piece, but I just want to say that the crisis that we're in, to me, right now, the city needs to find its way through to messaging the provincial government about renovations, because the number of people who are being renovated by that we cannot build housing as fast as landlords can rent evict tenants, and it's wrong. So to build housing, you start with an application, you go through four or five years. Think of the number of people that will be rent evicted over a four or five year period in our city. It's number one for me to find a way to keep people in their homes. Those, many of them, longtime tenants, those are still affordable rents. At Logan 245, people are paying $900 a month. The landlord wants to charge, guess what, $2,400 a month after a rent eviction. Shame, this cannot be happening in our city. We do not have all the tools, but this is a place to go with the Ontario government, the landlord and tenant board. They can't simply be approving, rent evicting people out of their long-term homes and people need to know they have the right to go back at a similar rent, and people don't know that. So I get very upset about rent evictions. So I want everybody here to come again on November the 20th at seven o'clock, hear your stories, give us your advice. Let's have a plan to deal with that, okay? Are you with me? <laughs> Thank you. So that's immediate. There's also a number of other immediate things that are taking place, and I want you all to be involved in that here today. Those are the 11 Housing Now sites, which we have a report coming up later for 7777 Victoria Park. The city's sites where we own that land outright and Create TO is doing the negotiations is for 50% affordability. That's much greater than any inclusionary zoning. 50% have to be affordable. And then we've reduced it so a whole number of them must be at 40% of average market rent, which you've talked about today. This is 11 sites of our land. I want you to be part of this really important process because this is actually building their applications out there. The next thing is those lands that we heard about today those lands that are on the transit line, the lands where there's 22,000 houses in the pipeline, where there's preliminary reports, that's a planning term, that are at Scarborough Community Council, where we've heard from the planners, nobody has gone there to talk about affordable housing. Will you go to Scarborough and talk about affordable housing? Yes, we need you. 
our chair is going to organize something for you with the chief planner in order to understand exactly where we're at and what you can ask for. Those are real, those are applications, those are to be built. I very much want to have a good, um, uh, and I'm sure there's other sites as well that are transit oriented. So to have a good inclusionary zoning bylaw that we can implement housing, that we can build. But I don't want us to just get stuck only on that when we have all of these other things. And I'm not being critical, but Scarborough Community Council doesn't have many people go and talk to it about housing, affordability. And some of you are from Scarborough. I'm counting on all of you to rally to those applications where we can achieve affordability and push the limit on that to maximize those units. 22,000 units using the city's official plan is four thousand affordable homes on a transit line. I think it's worth fighting for. I hope you agree with me. So let's move on all fronts forward. Every front possible for housing. Stop the rent evictions, the ones that are currently in the pipeline. Build the housing, build affordable housing, and get a good inclusionary zoning as best as we can from a government that doesn't really care. Thank you, everybody, for coming here today, and let's keep going. There's more to do. Thank you, Councillor Fletcher. A question, you have a question, Councillor Wong Tam? Uh, yes, Councillor Fletcher, I just want to clarify, with respect to uh, listing the large sites or other sites, um, is the expectation also to put that, uh, that request to uh, TCHC in the large revitalization sites that are currently underway? What is uh, yeah, so that would be under the Create TO collaboration, so I that would come back from them. I yeah. just want to clarify that you're expecting that uh, they would also report on uh, TCH to revitalization sites because they're, they're significant in size. That would be Create TO, and thank you for asking that because when I took over the Don Somerville site from the former councillor, there was no new affordable housing on that site now 100 units, not easy. Everybody's breaking through to a new place. And yes, I expect every bit of city-owned land where there can be affordable housing to be reported on. And Councillor, you know very well that TCHC has now the development function will go to create TO. So yes, they will report on that. Fantastic, thank you. Um, will, will, uh, is the expectation also to ensure that uh, everything that's happening uh, or proposed to happen on Quayside, as well as proposed development under master plan of, um, of the Portlands also be identified under this, uh, pr uh, this request? The Portlands already has a 30% requirement yes. through officially but, through But you should, you, you should anticipate seeing it listed. Uh, when I would anticipate set. to see that listed as 30% above the 20% that Council has. That was a motion Council supported that I made. And on Quayside, which is our one acre, we really do control that. Yeah. I don't know about the other, but we should have a pretty good discussion on if one and a half times average market rent is something we would be supporting at this. And time. is the expectation also to see staff uh, report back on any potential joint ventures that the City of Toronto may have uh, with respect to coal development if we're in uh, conversations around building schools together with uh, uh, with the TDSB or TCDSB, um, that that should also that should also be captured in there, along with hydro lands, uh, uh, provincial lands. No, uh, no, just all city-owned lands. Anything that the we, city we, touches. We cannot control what uh, the TDSB or the TCDSB does. Yep. We can only control. I think I just like be modest. We have right. lands. How are we managing them? When we're selling something to a developer then what are we expecting in return that isn't just money? Understood. I just want to clarify so we can all recognize what, we, what will be coming back to us. That's why I wanted to flesh this out a little bit further. That's, so, that is my thank expectation. You. Okay. So that would include the large sites, which does include all of our port lands. Yeah. And uh, one acre isn't a large site, but that agency is um, Waterfront Toronto were part of that agency. So I would expect that they would be part of the city's official plan. Okay. in order to achieve as much housing as possible on the waterfront and note that
that unfortunately, according to the Auditor General, Waterfront Toronto has only managed to achieve 12% on all of the sites rather than the 20 that they are mandated for across the water. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Bradford. Thanks very much. Um, I'd like to thank all of the deputants for taking your time uh, out of your days to be with here here with us this morning um, at City Hall and sharing your perspectives. Um, I think there's a lot of alignment here in this committee room and certainly we've all had a chance to work uh, very closely with many of you uh, over the past months and years and that work is, is heard and it's appreciated. Um, I think one thing that's very clear, abundantly clear, is we need every possible tool in the toolkit to address our affordable housing crisis. Uh, and, it, and it's one, frankly, that has been exacerbated by uh, legislation uh, that has come to us from the province over a number of years. This, we didn't just get here overnight. We didn't just get here with the last election, but it's certainly gotten worse. Um, I wanna thank our staff for all their work on this file. Uh, it's, it's been a journey uh, and one that's been, we've been on for a number of years. So inclusionary zoning, has been challenging for a number of reasons. And it, and it didn't just get challenging, you know, last year. This is something that the City of Toronto has been asking the province for since prior to amalgamation. So like a long time. And we actually thought we were finally there with Bill 107 when that landed in 2018. But then when the draft regulations came out, you know, from planning's perspective, it actually looked like this wasn't something that we were actually going to be able to implement. And I do want to thank and acknowledge ACORN's work on that file for convincing, at the time, Minister Milchin to revise that and, and bring forward something that was much more flexible. So then, right before the election, the province opens the doors uh, to muni municipalities to actually implement IZ in a more flexible, uh, quicker way. And then, of course, the election happened, and here we are again with what should be one of the most straightforward, most effective tools that we have as a city on the planning side to secure affordable housing, and, uh, and yet we're left in the lurch with Bill 108. So I hear your frustration. I feel that frustration. I think all of us here actually feel that frustration, uh, certainly staff as well. And the question is, how do we move forward? The issue is that we have a province, as we see time and time again, that will literally pass legislative changes to move forward their agenda here at Toronto City Hall. And I don't, I don't think that's right. Um, we saw it with the TTC upload discussions. Um, they rewrote the legislation uh, to achieve their own goals. So the question is, what do we do in response? Uh, I think there's good motions in front of us here that are going to help. Uh, and I understand the rationale, frankly, from what we heard from our chief planner and staff of, of trying to understand the impact of the policies and then working within that framework to move things forward. But time and time again, we as a city bring forward planning proposals, uh, and then the province ends up changing the rules or making them impossible for us to actually implement. So I'm concerned that affordable housing in the city cannot wait, right? And, and we're kind of in limbo here on these community benefit charges. That's the CBC thing that we've all been talking about, which will really dic dictate the financial analysis uh, and the ability for us to move forward with this model. And that's very frustrating. And I, I think this motion here from Councillor Perks is actually very thoughtful and smart, as they often are from oh. Councillor Perks. Oh. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I think this is going to allow us to... <laughs> uh, no one will ever know. We, a copy of him saying we don't have any hands, sir. No one will ever know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, in any case, I, I think this is thoughtful because this is the sort of ammunition, this is the information that we need to have that conversation of what the IZ framework looks like pre and post uh, Bill 108. And that's, that's the sort of stuff, and we're going to come back in February. Um, again, not soon enough, but a practical amount of time for our staff to do that work, to equip us with the information that's actually going to allow us to have that conversation with them and really push for a framework that is going to deliver the most amount of units, the deepest amount of affordability, and for the longest amount of time. So I do want to thank you all for coming out today. It's been very valuable. It's been helpful for us, uh, and hopefully we can move this forward. I'm very much looking forward to to seeing all of you back um, at our subcommittee to protect affordable rental housing. Uh, as everyone here has said, we need to see you there. We need to hear from you. Uh, and we're all looking forward to working with you on this. So thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Bradford. Um, oh. Chair, it is World Kindness Day, so. Oh, that's oh, why, Bradford. that's why. We had some acts of kindness. Uh, <laughs> 
some acts of kindness in here. Okay. So uh, I'm going to, you want to speak after I put them up? You've seen. Yeah, go ahead. Um, thank you very much. And I, I, I just really enjoy this committee, especially when, the, when we have these moments of brotherhood and sisterhood. Um, I, I want to thank the deputants uh, for coming out and speaking as passionately as you have. I recognize that this is not the first time uh, that you're bef appearing before the committee, and it's also not the sa it's not the uh, it's a, not a new message. And I want to thank you for all the time that you have uh, be be uh, appeared before us, and recognize that you're taking time out of your busy days and schedules away from work and family and other obligations to be here for the hours that you have. And I, I also want to recognize that. You know, as, uh, as we perhaps make requests of you to go to Scarborough or to North York, is that again we're asking you of your time freely. Um, and I just want to respect that, uh, that your time is valuable. So hopefully when you come, uh, you feel heard. Um, I want to thank staff for the report. And I, 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 I understand the, the, the technical um, process that we must adhere to. And I know that staff are being very thoughtful and strategic in the way they are positioning this next step. Um, I do want to acknowledge that that is not uh, because you are timid, and that's not because you don't want to get this right or get this done. Um, and I, I don't want to take anything away uh, from the, the fact that the staff are trying to take a look uh, at how to advance this important instrument of policy uh, and without getting quashed um, in it, you know, um, because you're anticipating where the next punch and body blow will come from. And I know that you folks are very smart. Um, I do think, and this is not a but, but it's just an add-on, I do think that uh, it's important for us to take a, not a, a pause, but rather a step forward, even if it's not the biggest step that we would like. Uh, and that's why I think that the motions coming from Councillor Perks, Councillor Fletcher, and what our chair is going to advance is absolutely critical in making sure that we take another step forward and get into fighting position uh, with more tools and more strength uh, in, in our uh, counter uh, when the province, what we anticipate is going to probably be, not be good news. Um, I think that when we talk about the province, whether it's the previous uh, government, uh, the Liberal government, or this government as a PC government, um, we talk about the province not listening to the uh, to Toronto residents, or perhaps not respecting Toronto City Council, um, I think we need to go a little bit deeper. I'd like to follow the money. And, uh, and I think what we need to really recognize here is that we're not really just fighting with another order of government. We are fighting with the development lobby. Very powerful, very moneyed, deeply invested in the, pow the, the, the corridors of power at Queen's Park um, in Ontario, uh, at, in Ottawa, and here at the city, uh, at City Hall. Uh, we need to understand who the opponents are. And this opponent, uh, is not interested in inclusionary zoning, despite perhaps some language that come out that, be, that is soft. And you'll never really see them, because that's not how big money really operates. They're in the room, and they're quiet. And they're usually the strongest one because they are quiet. So for us to, to counter such incredible forces, uh, means that we're going to have to be smart and strategic. And perhaps in this case, the smart and strategic move is taking that one step forward and making sure that when we do come forward with the, IZ, the inclusionary zoning policies that we want, uh, it's going to be the strongest position that we, are, that we have. And, and let us not forget that it's the puppet master that's maneuvering the puppets uh, which is in this case, this time around, it just happens to be Premier Ford and Minister Clark. Um, but do not um, take your eye off the, uh, the, the fight that our bigger opponent is right behind them. You will not see them. They operate in the shadows. And that is the very powerful development lobby. I don't want to paint a brush at all developers because that's not the case. Um, but certainly when it comes to global finance, the, where money is, uh, is moving, how hedge funds are behaving, how private equity funds are behaving, how private commercial bank is pre behaving, you're going to, I will bet you anything that they are not going to take 
and adopt inclusionary zoning, no matter how, how soft and gentle our policy could be, thinking that we could get it passed. They're going to fight us tooth and nail. Um, so that's, that's what's going to be resting in front of us. We should not kid ourselves. Um, but I know that if we get louder, as they get softer, sometimes that happens, um, this could happen. Uh, but I do think it's going to be a tough, tough, tough hill. If you thought it was tough just getting the staff reports out to, to where we are today, uh, wait till the IZ policies land and, and see what that fight looks like. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Um, I do have a motion, um, and uh, I want to start by thanking all the deputants to come here and also thank all the councillors here. I think there is actually some really good committee work that was done here just on this issue because we all got here, I think, with uh, the perception that we needed more from the report because we had two issues in front of us. We understand that staff is in a very difficult situation because they have to take in consideration the new life under Bill 108, but we also understand that we have a new world in front of us with Bill 108, that we need to continue this fight, that we need to continue to push for inclusionary zoning, that we need to continue to push for it as soon as possible, and that uh, that needs to be a political argument. And I think that what we've been able to do here in committee is actually ask staff to bring us that data, to bring us the scenario of what we could have and would have and have that to actually go uh, and clearly show what we have gotten, we would we would we'd get under pre-Bill 108, under uh, before a, a bill that was actually supposed to create more housing and speed up process. And I speak to some of you, Councillor Wong Tan, that has a ton of development award and she tells me development is not coming in because the unpredictability that there is in the in the market right now with this bill and we have this tool of ours which is a tool that is directly associated with planning tool that could have been well uh, more advanced now being to put together with master transportation studies with all kinds of other things that need to get done in order to get it implemented so I think that what we're going to be able to to get out of today is first of all I think there's a clear signal to staff that we're not pausing, we're not slowing down, we're full steam ahead, um, understanding that we have to create something that is going to be very defensible, that you know the feasibility and the predictability and transparency of the bylaw is going to have to happen, uh, but that we want staff to continue to work with all of you, with the sector, to have that done, but that we're also going to have in front of us what we could have had which I think will be really powerful come in February, and we'll see if the, if the regulations are out or not, but it'll actually be really, it would be really powerful to actually have the two scenarios, the two worlds of what we could get, could have gotten uh, back, and what we will, we will be getting. So um, I appreciate the work that we've all done in here. I hope I can get your support. I know that uh, we have quite a bit of work to staff, but the reality is this is a major issue for the prosperity of our city and of our citizens. Most important, this is human dignity. This is, this is home. This is the base of everything. And so do we have to ask our staff to just work a little bit faster? Yes. But I think that uh, we all, <laughs> we all have, you know, we all have family. We all have neighbors that are facing this really tough housing market out there, and we all see it out there in our city. And we we say our city can do better. So I think that uh, our staff will be right behind us to say, okay, let's get this done and give us the tools so that we can do our political work and do our political fighting that we need while they do the good work of working with everybody and creating a robust bylaw with the tools that they'll end up with. And I think that's what we've obtained here today. So thank you, everybody. And I hope we can vote on all these motions and support these motions because I think it's been really good work that we've done here today. I would move it as a package. Okay, all those in favor? Recorded vote. No, oh, as a package. As a package? Can we vote as a package? You want to just do the adopt the item as amended as a package? Yeah. Could do that. Okay. Recorded. I want them all recorded. All, re all recorded. <laughs> so the in first, support of. <laughs> the first motion on the screen, all those in favor? 
uh, Councillor Bradford, Councillor Perks, Councillor Fletcher, Councillor Bailao, Councillor Wong Tam. Any opposed? That motion carries unanimously. Motion two. Uh, the motion from Councillor Fletcher. All those in favor? Councillor Bradford, Councillor Perks, Councillor Fletcher, Councillor Bailao. Councillor Wong Tam, any opposed? None. That motion carries unanimously. And motion three from Councillor Bailao. Councillor, all those in favor? Councillor Bradford, Councillor Perks, Councillor Fletcher, Councillor Bailao, and Councillor Wong Tam, and that motion carries as well. All those in favor? Uh, the item as amended. Recorded vote as well. Okay. Councillor Bradford, Councillor Perks, Councillor Fletcher, Councillor Bailao, Councillor Wong Tam, that motion carries unanimously as well. Thank you so much, and Madam Chancellor, if I if I may, and I recognize that this uh, might be coming at a bit of an odd time, we're about to break for lunch. Um, there are a number of deputants uh, here who are speaking to item number four. Uh, many of them who are wearing red T-shirts. Um, they are. I, I recognize that we're heading to. Um, uh, to item number two, I was wondering if, there, if, the, uh, if the members of the committee would like to vary the order paper, uh, perhaps have um, that we deal with item number four before we come back to item number two. I know this is a tough decision because it's been already a very long morning. It just means some folks would get a longer lunch break. Uh, sorry, right. you're asking the committee to go to finish item four before lunch? No, no, I'm, oh. I'm suggesting that we, we, we order it uh, and, and deal with item number four immediately after lunch and, and even before we break for lunch and then, and then item number two, so we just vary it. Yes, that's right. Can I recommend that we deal with number one before lunch as well because there's no oh, deputants yeah. and so maybe we can dispose of that? Yeah. Okay. Okay, all those in favor of Councillor Wong Tam's motion? My motion is to, um, to deal with item number four, which is rent safe immediately after, after number one. After number one. <laughs> no? It just means that the folks who are here for Victoria, the Housing Now report, will get a very long lunch. Well, we're going to do that now. <laughs> we're going to. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let's proceed. Yeah. Yeah. So let's proceed with the agenda as as there's no consensus. So item uh, PH one two point one, which is uh, city initiated priority retail streets zoning bylaw amendments final report. Are there uh, any speakers on this item? Seeing none. Questions of staff. Seeing none. Speakers. Seeing none, motion to approve. Councillor Wong Tam, all those in favor? That carries. Okay. Item 10.2, Housing Now, Housing Now 777 Victoria Park Avenue zoning amendment. We do have a staff uh, presentation on this item. Do we have a staff presentation on 77? Yeah. So a very short one, so hopefully we'll complete this before lunch.
Okay. If I could ask for everybody's attention, it seems like staff is now ready to do a presentation item two. Thank you. Good morning. So thank you very much to the chair, to the members of the committee, and to everyone who has joined us this morning. My name is Paul Farish. I work in the City Planning Division in the Strategic Initiatives Unit. And we're quite excited to be here today to speak to you about uh, housing now, both specifically about something that's proposed at 777 Victoria Park Avenue, um, but also the Housing Now program overall. And I note that this is an important moment in the Housing Now initiative um, as we're coming to you with our first staff report with a series coming over the winter, all of them advancing something we've talked about for now three hours this morning, affordable housing, something we should be talking about for much longer as well. In the case of 777 Victoria Park Avenue, what you're going to see today is a reflection of a lot of staff work as well as significant public input into what can happen and should happen on a city-owned piece of property in their neighbourhood. Uh, in terms of housing now, again, this is the city putting forward its best foot, some of its best assets to address our biggest challenge, which is affordability in this city. We have in the Housing Now portfolio 11 properties across the city, and today we're reporting on just one of those sites, but we have three more reports coming this winter. And it's important to consider what that moment means. Uh, when we come forward as a staff with a planning report, we're advancing these sites from the planning and marketing per period to actual final approvals, construction, and occupancy of affordable housing that we acknowledge is urgently needed in this city. As I said, we're talking about key, important city-owned properties, some of our best assets being dedicated towards public good, towards affordable housing most certainly, but also, as you'll see at Victoria Park Avenue, important improvements to the neighbourhood in terms of childcare space, in terms of public realm improvements, other things that are desperately needed in this city. And as we would happily talk about housing units and numbers with you, I'd also like to, for you to consider that we're planning for people, that we're planning for communities, and we're ultimately planning for complete, inclusive, mixed-income, mixed-use communities across the city. We have spent three hours this morning talking about the housing challenges. The committee is well briefed on those, so I won't spend much more time on them, other than just to emphasize the fact that we accept this as being a crisis. We accept this as something that the city can act upon by putting forward its resources in this manner. Uh, we will have a report in the coming shortly on the broad spectrum of what the city can do across the housing spectrum to act on these affordability, issue, affordability issues. I would note that Housing Now fits within that. It's not every single uh, point across the spectrum that we're resolving through Housing Now, but we're most certainly acting on affordable rental and supportive housing needs through this uh, process. We have 11 sites, and those will be coming forward through the winter and through next year. We're estimating that we can deliver over 3,700 units of affordable rental housing across the city, and specifically that affordable housing is targeted towards those earning roughly between twenty dollars and $50,000 a year. The 11 sites are across the city. Today we're talking about Victoria Park Avenue, uh, but we have, as you'll note on the, on the map, many sites immediately approximate to transit. It's very important to emphasize again the fact that these are some of the best city-owned properties to the point Councillor Fletcher was bringing up earlier today, some of the best city-owned properties we have dedicated towards, again, our greatest challenge, affordable, affordability and affordable housing. The program we had approved by, for us uh, by City Council in January and this is a long series of measures, a long series of criteria, as well as financial contributions that move this as quickly as possible. I'll flag two, two key considerations in this program. One being that the affordable housing we're looking to secure through Housing Now is for a period of 99 years. And secondly, that the city is, in, is intending to, in almost all circumstances, retain the land that it owns and lease it to a development proponent rather than sell it off for a dividend. In terms of who we're building this affordable housing for, there's a lot of numbers up there, but just to simplify it as much as possible, on your left we have what you'd encounter in the market today, which many people this morning spoke to extreme prices for those looking for, for example, a one-bedroom. Housing Now can bring that price down significantly because of the various contributions by the city as well as our federal partners. Where we are today now is advancing us from that first stage where we are preparing the project design and, crucially, what the city expects of its city-owned land and taking it out to the market to find that third-party partner who can build it for us and with us and move us towards occupancy as quickly as possible. Specific to 777 Victoria Park Avenue, just very quickly, considering what we have in front of us in the report itself, we're talking about the uh, parking lot south of Victoria Park Station in the east end of the city. 
In this case, we're talking about the product of extensive consultation over the last nine months in the community, in long, well-attended open house sessions, as well as a lot of staff work, vetting and developing a proposed concept that we have for you for this site. What's shown in the report is both a development concept prepared through that process, delivering over 500 residential units, half of which would be affordable rental, two buildings on site. And what we're also recommending through the report is a zoning uh, framework, a zoning envelope that allows for the actual development of that building in the immediate term. This you have here the building and its conceptual massing. It's important to note that there's the affordable housing component here, but also retail uses, childcare, and community space serving a neighborhood improvement area. Just finally now, the recommendations that we'll be considering now and after lunch, I expect, are uh, proposals from staff on revising the zoning bylaw in a manner that allows for the development of the concept I just showed you, and also two further recommendations moving this development process along in terms of addressing a passenger pickup drop-off facility on site, as well as possible use of uh, paid public parking in the near future. With all that said, we're very happy to take your questions today and we look forward to seeing you next month and the weeks and months after that on further Housing Now site. We would love to have you back every month, if yeah. you don't mind. We'll have to be here. Thank you. Thank you. And I think we'll leave questions of, of staff for after the deputants. So we'll start with the deputants on this item right after lunch at 1.30. And if Thank anybody you. wants to sign up, they should just... Yep, if there's a list of deputants. If you haven't signed up, if your name is not on the list, please sign up to, to speak.